So I think we can start. So uh, I would like to welcome you all. Uh, thank you very much for participating in this uh, virtual meeting. Uh, as I said before, we were very uh, disappointed to have to cancel our uh, meeting in Bordeaux. So it's, it was very nice uh, for me to uh, see that, in fact, John initiated the idea of uh, having this uh, virtual meeting and immediately Scott and Ford said that it was a great idea. So I really want to thank you guys because this is, this is really, really uh, great to uh, be with you even virtually uh, today. Um, I, will all, I would like to add that we are going to have a second uh, virtual meeting uh, soon, probably, because uh, Margaret, uh, Thomas Bosch, uh, Samir, Akasha, uh, a few others agreed, uh, Paul Griffith agreed on uh, giving a talk. It's going to be rather centered on Bordeaux and Sydney in terms of timing. So I'm sorry for those who, you know, this is the, the, the best way we can. So we, we, we're going to try to do our best. I think we found a moment that would be uh, okay for many of us. Uh, so it's going to be soon and I will keep everyone updated about this. Um, so for today, we have a, a fantastic lineup of prominent biologists. Obviously, uh, they've all done very interesting work on the concept of holobiont, which is what is going to be our focus today. Uh, what is very nice, I think, is that our speakers, our three speakers today, have uh, some disagreements, also some uh, uh, common views on holobionts, and we thought that it would be great to uh, give them the opportunity to present their views, present their arguments, and also present their objections, of course. So we shared the papers, six papers, two for each speaker with you all. So I hope you got the link. If not, it was included in my uh, uh, previous email, so you can easily find this uh, six papers. Um, Special thanks to Joan Rothgarden because it's early in the morning in Hawaii, as we said before. Uh, thank you as well to Margaret, uh, who is in the same situation in Hawaii. And Pierrick, as I said before, uh, uh, it's the middle of the night in Sydney. So thank you all. Uh, thank you also to Thomas Bosch, um, who uh, is uh, uh, one of those who has insisted on the importance of the concept of holobiont, uh, Lisa Lloyd as well. So several of the people who have defended or tried to better define this concept of holobiont are with us today. So that's, that's very cool, very nice, and we want to thank them. Uh, Andrew Inkman is also with us. He worked with Ford and, we will, uh, and the, the papers that uh, uh, Ford shared included a, a PNAS paper uh, co-written by Ford and Andrew. Uh, Lin Xu is with us from Vienna and she wrote a paper with Scott and I think this is the paper that Scott you're going to present uh, uh, today. Um, we are a limited number of participants, 26. This is to allow uh, discussions after each talk. Remember that each talk is going to is gonna, is gonna, uh, be for 30 minutes and uh, 20 minutes for Q&As. So I'm going to ask everyone to ask short questions and speakers to give short answers because I'm sure that there will be uh, many questions and, and perhaps objections. Um, the meeting is recorded, video recorded, as I said before. Um, so it's got to be uh, uh, uploaded on YouTube um, uh, because if I understood correctly, the participants, uh, the speakers all said that uh, it was okay for them. Um, I think that it's already 11, minute, 11 minutes past, so we're going to uh, uh, start with uh, our excellent friend Scott Gilbert. Scott Gilbert is a uh, Howard Schneiderman Professor of Biology Emeritus at Swarthmore College uh, and also Distinguished Professor Emeritus at the University of Helsinki in Finland. He now lives in Portland, Oregon. So you see the environment of Portland around, <laughs> around Scott, where I think it's 10 a.m. in the morning. Oh yeah, nice, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Scott. Okay. Uh, as you all know, Scott is the author of uh, one of the most widely used textbooks in developmental biology. Um, the title is Developmental Biology. I think the first edition was in 1985. Now it's the 12th edition, uh, co-written with uh, Michael Berezi. Uh, and published in uh, 2019. 
Uh, Scott also co-authored another very important book or textbook, uh, Ecological Developmental Biology, two editions, the uh, more recent in 2015. I don't know if there's going to be another one. I hope so. Oh, good. I hope so, too. Um, as you know, as well, Scott played a very important role in the maturation, so to speak, of Evo Devo and also Eco Evo Devo, so ecological developmental biology with an important evolutionary component. He also worked on developmental symbiosis. I mean, he initiated several of us, me at least, uh, about developmental symbiosis together with Margaret McFarland Knight, who is with us, uh, as I said before today. And Scott, this is the last thing I want to say, has always been interested in history and philosophy of the life sciences. He has interacted with many philosophers, and this is a great pleasure for me to say that the paper he's going to present today was prepared and co-written with uh, our friend Lin Xu, who is also with us, as I said today. So thank you very much, Scott. You start with your talk for 30 minutes. Okay, let's see what I can do here. Let's see, where is... Trying to get the uh, what came on immediately the last time. Let's, I'm going to take this off and try putting this on again with the screen. Okay. okay, it's not as quick as it came on the last time. Let me see if I can do this here. Let's see, I need to. For some reason, this is not where it was the last time. Let's see. If you bear with me a moment, try to get this up so I can share a screen. And here we go. Get share. And I'm going to put this on here and see if this works. Does that work? Do you see the yep. cow? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to speak in a session with Joan Roughgarden and for Doolittle. Thank you, Tom, for uh, your vote of confidence. Uh, I apologize to anyone who expected Jack Gilbert. Uh, uh, you can leave. Uh, when I was preparing this talk, I had a sense of deja vu because it was getting into areas that I had worked on many years ago, even decades ago, having to do with the intellectual traditions in the life sciences. I was actually asked by a friend of mine, a social worker, what was the difference between molecular biology and biochemistry? And uh, I gave him the standard structural function answers, and I didn't believe them as I was talking about them. And I eventually wrote this paper talking about the two big traditions in biology, one being life as replication, and that I said was the foundations of molecular biology, used the crystal as the metaphor, used the virus as the simplest living entity, and that was opposed to a metabolic tradition, which was the origins of biochemistry, and that used the wave or the whirlpool as metaphors, and saw the cell as the simplest living entity. And in this paper, I said that the replicative tradition and the metabolic tradition, molecular biology and biochemistry, were integrated through two things. The operon model, where metabolism was controlled by genes, while gene expression was controlled by metabolites, and by DNA polymerase activity, where there was an enzyme that took instructions from its substrate. And now I was thinking, holy mackerel, I'm now trying to do the same thing. This whole group of us may be trying to do the same thing with the evolution of holobionts, where changes in symbiont metabolism, again, uh, as Ford brilliantly put out in his paper, uh, opens new evolutionary niches. And that's what Lynn and I were getting at. So I want to talk a little bit about the notion of life as a function of metabolism. And the philosopher Hans Jonas, I think, said this the best, where the organism, he said, must appear as a function of metabolism rather than metabolism as a function of the organism. That the organism was its metabolism. 
And here we go back, you know, Cuvier, an anatomist, likened living being to a whirlpool in which matter is less essential than form. And Thomas Huxley famously talked about his transubstantiation of matter between lobsters and epicures, where he ate a lobster dinner and the material of the lobster became, became the material of Thomas Huxley. But if he went home and was shipwrecked, the crustaceans relatives would do the same to him and convert Huxley's substance into that of lobsters. So that the life was a function of its metabolism. For E.B. Wilson, this was the raison d'etre for genes. Wilson said, inheritance is the recurrence in successive generation of like forms of metabolism. And for Wilson, metabolism included both development and physiology. And for him, the chromosomes directed metabolism. So inheritance is the recurrence in successive generations of like forms of metabolism. So extending E.B. Wilson's view of metabolism to holobionts, the holobiont describes the host and its symbiotic microbial communities including viruses and cellular microorganisms, and the microbial symbionts can be inherited vertically, horizontally. They can act in a contextual manner as harmless, harmful, or helpful. The host and its microbiome function anatomically, physiologically, and immunologically, developmentally and behaviorally as a functional unit, the holobiont. And the fitness of this holobiont depends in part upon the interactions of the microbes and the host. Now, microbial symbioses mediate several different types of phenotypes. One is they mediate the developmental phenotype. So here you see on the far left, the capillaries of the intestinal villi, which I'll go into. They don't form well without the microbes. The euprimna squid, which uh, Margaret, will talk, can talk about, and I hope will, uh, does not have a functional light organ until it's colonized by Vibrio fissurae. The light organ is a product of the symbiont and the host. Nutritionally, uh, here we have the P. aphid, where we know that Bucknera uh, symbiont allows it to have sap as a uh, food source. Detoxification is an important part of symbiosis, and here you see the uh, green, uh, 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 be this is a green mint beetle, uh, which is detoxifying the uh, terpenes of the mint plant. And you have here a Riptortis, which is a soybean bug, and it has symbionts that will uh, metabolize pesticides. The immune function is critical, and it's a very important function that's often supplied by symbionts. Our immune systems as mammals get matured as with symbionts. This is the uh, IgM, the uh, immature B cells, which do not form properly in the gut-associated lymphoid tissue without symbionts. And to the right, you see a uh, poisonous salamander whose poisons are made by the uh, symbionts uh, on its skin and in its gut. So the symbionts are giving us many phenotypes. When we talk about metabolism, one of the best examples of co-metabolism between host and symbionts is probably the bug Planococcus, where to make phenylalanine, you need the genomes of the host, you need the genomes of the uh, symbiont, and you need the genome of the symbionts symbionts. Planococcus, Tremblaya, and Morinella. And together, those will make tryptophan, which is uh, phenylalanine, which is useful for both all three uh, organisms. So you have one organism composed of three organisms. They are in metabolic communication with each other. That goes too for uh, mammals, such that uh, the symbionts that are in our gut make metabolites, they get transformed by the host into new metabolites. 
and about one third of an animal's metabolome, a mammal's metabolome, the diversity of molecules found in our blood has a microbial origin. And the circulatory system extends the chemical impact of the microbes of the gut throughout the body. Recently, this was shown to also go through, the microbes are making things in the gut that go through the circulation, which go to the placenta, and which actually cause changes in the gene expression in the uh, 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 embryos that are in the placenta. So that you have this very widespread communication of the metabolites coming from the bacteria. Uh, in our guts, uh, the bacteria will take uh, tryptophan, convert it to indole, and make things like IPA, which is a neuroprotective antioxidant. Uh, we'll also induce cells to make serotonin. 95% of our peripheral serotonin is induced by uh, fatty, short-chain fatty acids, which are made by the bacteria. Certain disease states are disease states of mutual co-metabolism. And this was a paper by Smith, who showed that quasiorcor is not merely a protein deficiency disease, that's what I learned, quasi-Urocor was protein deficiency, but it's protein deficiency in the presence of certain microbes. Gut microbes also are important for the regulation of normal enteric development. And even the enteric nervous system is regulated by the microbes. So the enteric nervous system, which controls our peristalsis, are getting rid of food, are pooping, that is controlled by the enteric nervous system, which is in turn controlled by the serotonin made by the microbes. So intestinal transit in germ-free animals increases when you put bacteria in it. Serotonin increases with bacteria. The gut microbes regulate serotonin release, reception, and neural maturation in the myenteric plexus of the mouse. They produce short-chain fatty acids that will be important that cause the production and release of serotonin from the enterochromaffin cells of the colon. So they're involved not only in our metabolism, but also in our development. And developmental symbiosis is critical. And here we have some of Margaret McFaulney's work uh, with Uprimna. Uprimna is the bobtail squid of Hawaii. It is not born with a functional light organ. Its ventrum collects bacteria, selects gram negatives, kills or releases others, and only allows in vibrio fissurae, which interact with the ventral skin to make the light organ. And here, again, nature, this whole thing about symbiosis is not fuzzy. It's not love. It's selection in this part that Uprimna basically tans, oxidizes, kills gets rid of all the other bacteria, and now allows in Vibrio fissurae and only light competent Vibrio fissurae. It's very selective. In mammalian guts, as I mentioned before, the induction of the gut capillaries depends on microbes, especially uh, uh, Bacteroides uh, theta iota micron. Uh, so here you have the intestinal vessels without the microbes on the left, left this is in a germ-free mouse. If you add microbes within 10 days, you can get those, those intestines shown in green here. And this seems to be due to a particular paracrine factor called angiogenin-4. The gene expression of angiogenin-4 can be induced by Bacteroides bacteria. And here on the right is a uh, graph and this is the graph that got me into this whole field. I had known about Margaret's work, and Margaret's work was mentioned in, I think, the 1995 edition of my textbook when it was you know, really early. But what, what made me think this whole thing of developmental symbiosis was universal was the work by Hooper and Stapbeck uh, in uh, Gordon's lab, uh, which showed that the gut capillaries of mice were dependent on bacteria. And what you see here is this is angiogenin 
mRNA. Angiogenin 4 mRNA is on the y-axis here. And the germ-free mouse is set to 1.0. Uh, I don't know if you could see, if, but if you go to, uh, uh, you might be able to use your computer, whoops, and go to see that the conventionally raised is about tenfold what the germ-free is. And you can reproduce that just by adding back to the germ-free mice Bacteroides theta iota micron. So Bacteroides theta iota micron induces angiogenin 4 expression and secretion in the panath cells of the small intestine. Angiogenin 4, as its name implied, induces the gut mesoderm to form capillary vessels. Okay, it's a blood vessel former. Angiogenin 4 has an off-label use. It's toxic against listeria and Enterococcus, which are two competitors of Bacteroides. So Bacteroides also acts as part of our innate immune system in this respect. It helps itself as it helps us, and it helps makes the mammalian gut capillaries. S uh, developmental microbes. Microbes are also active in development in making the immune system. Germ-free animals have impaired development of Peyer's patches. They have a very reduced number of naive T cells. They have improperly formed B cell production with an imbalance of the helper T cells. Microbes seem, seem to be important in inducing the immune system. And the immune system, as it's developing, helps the microbes find a place. So I have over here some quotations. And the quotations are just, to me, very humorous because this is not the immune system I grew up with. This is not the immune system I taught, taught about in the 1980s during the AIDS epidemic. I talked it about an immune system that was the defense weaponry of the body. But here, I see that the immune system establishes a sustainable host-microbe relationship. It creates an optimal symbiotic environment, and that the gut microbiota utilized immunoglobulin A, which I taught was you know, the first line of defense inside the body, for mucosal colonization. Instead of being an agent that keeps away microbes, the immune system, actually the early immune system, helps the microbes find a place to live in the gut. Instead of being a defensive weaponry, the immune system is like a park ranger that weeds out things that don't belong, but helps put in things that do belong. So the symbionts then, once they're in and helped by the immune system, help the immune system to mature. Now those are early developmental events. I want to talk about some, early, those are late developmental events. There are also early developmental events as well, including uh, in this nematode, the ability to form the anterior posterior axis. That ability to form the anterior posterior axis depends on Wolbachia symbionts being in the posterior of the embryo, of the two day, of the two cell embryo. If Wolbachia are absent, the axis is random. The anterior posterior axis of a worm, as you can imagine, is an important axis. It doesn't form properly half the time in. Uh, animals without the Wolbachia symbionts. So development is really critical. As I say, you know, you complete me. Development is a holobion function, a team sport. Animals do not exist as independent entities and development involves numerous interacting species. Sympoesis, developmental symbiosis, is literally becoming with the other. So it's not only life is not only the competition of you know, each against all, it's also becoming with the other as Desprey and Haraway have pointed out. And so also you have co-development. Symbiosis is not merely between fully formed consenting adults. You have symbiosis forming that adult. That symbiosis exists early on and you don't have an adult without it. So you have this organism which is made by symbiosis. 
How do we get these organisms? There are two major ways, as you know. One is vertical transmission, which can be done transovarianly, as in Wolbachia, uh, in Drosophila, and on the left, right, uh, left hand, upper side, you see the red dots going into the oocyte. Those are Wolbachia bacteria going into the Drosophila oocyte. Also, you have propagule mediated transmission in budding, the chlorella in Hydra viridis getting in as the bud forms. Now, you also have, in addition to the vertical, which gives you just about 100% transmission, horizontal transmission. And horizontal transmission, for instance, can be the maternal transmission through the birth canal, such as how we get back to roides as this giraffe is being born uh, from the mother giraffe. And I put it over the line here because in some ways, some people consider this to be a vertical mode of transmission, uh, an immediate neighborhood transmission, as it's been called. So this kind of straddles the line. It isn't 100% transmission per species, close to 70% though. And about 8 million genes are transmitted as opposed to the 22,000, for instance, in the human genome. So there's maternal transmission through the birth canal. Also, horizontal transmission can include coprophagy, the eating of the bacteria from the feces. And one example of this is in the koala, where the mother koala mixes her poop with her milk and smears it on the face of her kid. That's uh, one easy way of getting the uh, bacteria from the mother. That's also about 100% transmission. On the other side of horizontal transmission, you get environmental acquisition, such as what I mentioned before of uh, the Vibrio uh, bacteria being acquired by Euprimna. Euprimna is not born with these bacteria, but it gets them from the environment. What you have though is extremely strict selection. So for horizontal transmission, what I wanna say is that you have a non, random transmission of microbes. Well, actually in both cases, you have non-random transmission of microbes. You have a birthright from the mother. You have selection by the mother and by the offspring with the possibility of phylosymbiosis where you have a very strict interaction between the genome of the host and the microbes. And then you also have the redundant functions of the microbes as Forded points at, um, points out in it's the song, not the singer hypothesis, that you have many microbes having multiple functions and it's these functions that are important and more important than the species of microbe itself. So I think that you get the non-transmission of microbes and the redundant function of microbes and together they will cause the functional transmission of traits from one generation to the next. Now, as I mentioned before, you have uh, in uh, Euprimna very strict selection where you have multiple stages where you have from an environment of many microbes of which Vibrio is not a major portion, you have the winnowing, as Margaret has called it, where many are called, few are chosen, to quote Matthew. So I think here sometimes a singer can be critical and making a team is a competitive effort. I mean, again, as I said, it's not warm and fuzzy. Only one species makes the team and the sports metaphor of making the team is very deliberate. If you wanna be the goalie on a football team, you might be trying out with many other goalies and you might not have to be the strongest one. You have to be the one that interacts best with all the other people on the team. Bacterial selection also occurs in mammals. And we see this in humans, where the bacteria of the reproductive tract in humans changes during the third trimester of pregnancy. And so it's not the normal suspects. There are certain bacteria that are kind of chosen to be for the next generation. And then after the bacteria are in, are trying to colonize the gut of the newborn, the mother feeds the bacteria milk, feeds the infant milk, and that milk has two 
types of nutrients. One is nutrient, obviously, for the baby. The other, though, is nutrients for certain bacteria, such as Bifidobacteria longum, which you want to be a first colonizer. It's a good thing. It's a good bacteria that you want. It will attract Bacteroides and other colonizers. You want to have that growing in first. And so the mother actually selects for its propagation by feeding it certain sugars. So I want to talk now about Holobiont Evo Devo. And this is what I want to talk about the paper that Lynn and I did. Because if evolution is caused by changes in development, which is what evolutionary developmental bio is about, and if development is caused in part by microbes, that's what I just mentioned, the sympoesis, then changes in an animal's microbiome or microbiome host relationships can be a cause of evolution. And I want to talk about the developmental symbioses facilitating the origin and evolution of herbivory. One thing we have to realize is that herbivory comes in late in evolution. It's a derived condition. Meat eating is not derived. Herbivory is derived. And I can go through the data on this, but I don't have time. But eating animals is eating. Eating plants requires cellulose and pectin degrading symbionts. It's not easy. This the kind of apotheosis of the plant eaters are the ruminants, where you have a stomach, a portion of the stomach, which is 85% the uh, volume of the stomach, is a rumen, which is the house of the symbiotic microbes. The rumen is essentially a large anaerobic fermentation chamber where plant-degrading rumen bacteria, bac uh, microbes, bacteria, protozoa, archaea, fungi, ferment otherwise non-digestible plant-based foodstuffs into primarily the volatile fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. Okay, so you have this rumen, this huge part of the stomach, which we don't have as you know non-ruminants. It's digesting plants. So you have here the cellulose degrading bacteria, fungi, and protists, which digest the cell walls into hexoses, you have the fermenting bacteria digesting the hexosis into short chain fatty acids. And then you have the methagenic uh, archaea, which reduce the end product CO2 into methane. And that actually accelerates the reaction because the fermentation causes a lot of hydrogen ions to build up. You need to get rid of those hydrogen ions so you don't block the, uh, the pathway. And that is done by the archaea that reduce CO2 to CH4. And in addition, you have detoxifying bacteria that prevent or eliminate poisons from the plants. The plants are trying to stop being eaten. They make poisons. The cow is not born with a functional rumen. It has a small immature rumen that get colonized after birth. And it gets colonized in two steps. The first three days, it gets colonized by the bacteria that it gets from its mother. But then there's a niche construction because in this area, the, uh, anaero the aerobes and the facultative anaerobes together get rid of the oxygen so that only the strict anaerobes will survive in this environment. So you have the niche being made, which becomes anaerobic. And then that niche stays as long as the cow is getting milk from its mother because the milk, if you see this diagram here, passes through this groove, which take it into the abomasum, which is the normal stomach, and it bypasses the rumen. But once the milk stops, that esophageal groove perishes. It goes away, and the food, which is now grain, goes directly into the rumen. In the rumen, the microbes that are there break down the cellulose into the hexoses these become fermented into butyric acid and propionic, propionic acid. And what does, the bupronic, what does the butyric acid do? It causes the growth of the gut. It causes the growth of the rumen. The butyric acid produced by the microbes causes the expansion of the rumen and the development, the differentiation of the rumen. And we see here, 
This was first showed in 1959 by Sander. But you have here the rumen and you just give it controlled sodium chloride into it. If you add butyric acid, you get rumen growth and differentiation. Propionic acid, a little bit less growth and differentiation. And now you could see that the regulation is being done by its transcription factors and paracrine factors are being upregulated by the butyrate. Butyrate can work as a G protein stimulant or it can work as a nucleosome modifier. It inhibits uh, histone deacetylase. Okay. So there's a dietary subset of core rumen bacteria and uh, that dictates the dairy cow productivity and emissions. It interacts with the host genome. This is just be, this is a paper in 2019. We're just finding out the, the names of these bacteria. There's a core of about 454 prokaryotes, 12 protists and 46 fungi shared between breeds of cattle. That's less than 0.25% of the possible uh, species. Uh, this is a really complex ecosystem. Uh, hereditary, uh, the heritability of the rumen OTUs in the cows is important, more so than in humans. The cow genotype is important. The origins of herbivory come through symbiosis and niche construction. There are three types of symbiosis. One is obviously the developmental symbiosis, where the microbes build the rumen. There's nutritional symbiosis where the microbes digest the plant material, producing 70% of the cow's energy. And there's protective symbiosis where the microbes detoxified plant poison. So the cattle provide masticated food for the microbes. They provide detritus basically, well-heated rooms and roommates, and probably host lipids for the bacterial cell membranes and walls. There are also two types of niche construction. There's the perturbational niche construction where the microbes help build the rumen. There's also, as Lynn was quick to point out, mediational niche construction where the ruminal microbes alter the environment experienced by the cow. This environment is now food where it wasn't before. So we say that the cow is the holobiont, not merely the animal component. And we could talk about song and singer just very briefly, but I think that they are both needed. Uh, I think in cellulose digestion, the song is critical, that you have many cellulose digesting and fermenting microbes in the cow. There are many di cellulose digesting species in its rumen, many genes for cellulose digesting enzymes in many bacteria. So you have redundancy in both the species and within the different species themselves. Then there are sometimes where the singer is important, such as the bacteria Synergistes jonesii, which allows Hawaiian goats to eat the legume, uh, which, could, which is making mimosine, which tries to protect the plant from being eaten. Uh, this bacteria is now in livestock feed to allow other, other cows to eat uh, uh, different uh, strains of, uh, of, uh, of legumes. Also, the Vibrio fisheri story that I mentioned and the Aramona story in uh, zebrafish show the importance of individual microbes, which can't be replaced. So I think that each entire microbiome is part of its plasticity network. And just as a molecule, even toxins, are considered part of the organism's metabolome, so many species, even parasites, must be considered part of the uh, organism's holobiome. And what I'm working on now, which I won't talk about, uh, is I'm trying to look at uh, the rumen microbiota as a morphogenetic field, trying to combine developmental notions and uh, ecological notions, where the formation of stable communities in the uh, rumen is very much analogous to the formation of stable stelsates during development. And so evolution by genome acquisition something that Lynn Margulis had talked about uh, many, many years ago, 1990s, I think is something that we now see as an important function in evolution, and that we now see that the evolving holobiont needs those symbionts to open up 
new evolutionary trajectories. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Scott. So I don't know if we can upload or if there's a way. Oh yeah, there's a way of doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, looking, like I'm, I'm looking for the, uh, here we go, stop share. There Thank we go. You. Thank you very much, Scott. That was great. And I'm sure uh, there's going to be many uh, uh, questions or remarks. So I don't know what's the best way of for proceeding here to that. So I guess people can send me, uh, use the conversation option and tell me that they want to talk unless there's something. Oh, no, no, you said raising your hand is, is possible. So let me see if I can. So, so if someone, I don't see any, oh yeah, Javier. Yes, uh, thank you, Scott. I really like the talk. And as you know, I really like your work on the room on, on cows, especially. I have one question because at some point you said that every single microbe is important in the rumen. And I was wondering whether uh, you meant by that, like the, there has been a screen on the species that happened on the rumen, or actually what happens is that the taxonomic units, the operational taxonomic units that are happening there are more or less co-occurring transgenerationally. Mm -hmm. Does it refer to the species itself or just to the yeah. function, the right. functional yeah. content? Yeah, well, actually, what I meant by saying that the, I include all the species of microbes in the holobiome is that I view the, whole, the microbiome as a, a, a network for plasticity that can go one way or another way. And we don't know what way it's going to go. It depends on the context. And so in addition to being uh, part of the animal that's functioning now, you have a part which is, you know, it'll, maybe it'll function later. We don't know. It depends what the context, what it finds. And so uh, uh, that's why I want to include it as uh, part and parcel of the whole of biome, even though it's not functioning, is because uh, it's part of the plasticity system. Uh, I can relate this regularly right to Donald Trump's view of, uh, you know, we don't need protection. We don't need the CDC because uh, when we want them, we'll get them. Uh, we don't need to think about things in advance. And uh, I think that the uh, having all these different microbes in the environment allows, you know, okay, if I happen to eat this, I'll be protected. Uh, it's part of the plasticity uh, and protection of the Holobiont. <clears throat> yeah. I thought it. I thought it interesting that the uh, uh, correlations between uh, the OTUs and the uh, core uh, microbiome was like tenfold stronger in the cow than in uh, humans. Uh, they they probably need it a lot more. They they get seventy percent of their energy from from the grass and grains. Andrew. Oh, and then Margaret. Sorry, trying to get sound and video. Okay. Um, I love that talk. It was fantastic and really interesting. I just wanted you to say a little bit more at the end because I was uh, about what you said at the end because I was so interested in that section. And that was just the bringing together of. Um, there, there's a lot of literature out there in the medical world that treats microbiomes in humans as something like organ systems that's been out there. Um, and so I'm curious that that section at the very end where you said, I'm going to take some work in developmental biology and I want to bring this together with ecology to sort of understand the, how, how these, um, the rumen as a functional organ, which involves microbes works and how it comes together. So I'm just I don't, I know you, you, you only gestured at this really quickly, and that's probably because you didn't want to talk about this section, but um, I'm just inviting you to say a little bit more about where that project's going, because I think it's fascinating. Yeah, it, it isn't that I want, didn't want to talk about it. It's uh, be, because I was running out of time. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got a note from Thomas saying four minutes, four minutes. Uh, <laughs> right, okay, I see. Okay, so, Basically, what I'm thinking of, well, if you look at the, some of the papers in the rumens, especially now, one of the big problems is how to get rid of methane. I mean, when you, when, 
I mean, New York Times had a big article earlier this month on the business of getting rid of methane from cows. Right. If cows were a country, they'd, they'd make 16% of the greenhouse gases. Uh, so getting rid of methane from cows is an important ecological issue. And what the people who are working on it, uh, as you can see in the right hand, they kind of see equilibrium states, which they represent mm -hmm. as these landscapes over here, where uh, depending on context, uh, you can go towards the methane or you could go towards the uh, short chain fatty acids. And mm -hmm. how do you get there? Well, you could get there by changing the environment of the rumen, perhaps by changing the pH of the rumen, perhaps by actually adding microbes, especially algae in the food, that might be able to take the rumen down a non-methogenic path. And the language that Moraes and Mizrahi and others are using reminds me so much of the network hypotheses for forming a stable cell state. Like each hmm. cell is a different state of interactions. And there are very few cell states that are compossible, if you will, that will work together. And these are the cell types of our body. Most interactions won't work, but these are the stable ones. And you get here uh, what was called by Waddington, the epigenetic landscape, as you start off with a pluripotential, pluripotential entity, and you go into less potential and finally a stable state. And I think that's what the rumen microbiome system is. And so I think that network theory might work for both cases. And this is kind of what I'm playing with right now is that the same network theories that people like Stu Kaufman and uh, uh, Huang Xu are using for uh, developmental biology might also work for ruminal ecosystems and maybe other ecosystems in, in general. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Margaret. Yes, thanks, Scott. That was just a phenomenal talk. And Thank I'm very excited by your ideas. I mean, one of the, the, the I have actually two comments. One is that um, the organism is its metabolism, when you were talking about in the very beginning. Um, one of the things that occurred to me is you were talking about inheritance through generations. Um, and, uh, you know, you over, you know, you retain that metabolism. One of the things that occurred to me is that the microbes, of course, um, uh, mo a lot of their, uh, their inheritance is not vertical. And so in those cases, um, the, the traits uh, can be acquired so quickly that they don't adhere to that kind of, at least in my mind. That's one comment. It uh, doesn't apply so easily to bacteria. The other one is when you were talking about vertical and horizontal transmission, um, I think your comment about ecology being so important is really essential in that context because um, in, in aquatic environments, the animals are surrounded by 10 to the sixth bacteria per mil or something like this. And all of the animal body plans arose in the oceans in the background of this heavy microbial interaction. Um, and there were two things they had to do was they, they had to resist being fouled. <laughs> and at the same time, they had to, they had to acquire uh, their symbionts. And so there, there did have to be a winnowing. Um, the other thing is that when, when animals then made, or yeah, when the water to land transition occurred in the variety of phyla that, that did so, um, one of the, the, <laughs> The, the things that happens is you have to have in your horizontal transmission, you must have some kind of facilitation because the water is not supporting this huge uh, group of bacteria. And so uh, you, you don't have an opportunity to pass the environment over your surfaces the way you right. do if you're, Mike, if you're mm -hmm. in an aquatic environment. So I think that in, incorporated into the behavior and whatnot. So a lot of people, um, you know, Lynn Margulis and, and uh, Monica Bright and people who think about the, you know, transmission, consider vertical transmission um, incorporation into embryogenesis. Mm -hmm. And so that um, anything that happens during or after birth 
uh, particularly in terrestrial animals, is still considered horizontal. Yeah, yeah. the uh, right now there's some fascinating things going on in uh, acqu acquiring new symbionts, uh, and probably the red turpentine beetle uh, mm -hmm. is the best example and kind of a scary one where the red turpentine beetle found outside my my office here uh, is a minor Pacific Northwest tree pest and actually probably helps because it degrades damaged trees. It bores into the bark of damaged trees and it uses a fungus to, dam to get, you know, entry into the bark and stuff. Uh, and it was a minor pest, not a problem. However, when lumber got transported to China, this beetle went with it. And it found in China a new symbiont, a new fungus, which allows it to eat living trees and non-damaged trees. And over 10 million trees have been destroyed by the red turpentine beetle with its new fungal symbiont. And uh, the problem is that it could come back into the Pacific Northwest because we don't have any law against the importation of the red turpentine beetle since it's already here. So now it's acquired a new symbiont, it can come back and do damage. So uh, the acquisition of symbionts, I think, is uh, something which will be absolutely critical for you know, pest management studies. Uh, it, it's already, uh, my friends in the Oregon State Department of Pest Management are really worried. Other questions? Tom, you had? I can, Thomas? Oh, sure, Thomas. It's, it's, if, you, if you can, there's an option to raise your hand that allows me to see on my screen that you raise your hand. Uh, but that, but that's, that's perfectly fine. Go, Thomas. I wrote your chat, but maybe that also doesn't work. Okay, we can get together. Scott, thank you so much. Uh, it's fantastic, um, of course, and each time I listen to you, I, I, uh, it blows my mind. And um, so if I, I have agreement and I have a question and a slight... Um, slight of feeling that maybe you you're always very provocative and maybe and that comes to the to your very last part of your talk the, the agreement is i think very much that uh, life is metabolism i think whatever we know now about the holobion all of it all of it is metabolically driven and uh, we are using metabolic modelers now and they all say how much that is integrated and so that is we have to, to think about metabolism and because of that uh, the sing and singer and the song uh, example is of course very good because it doesn't depend on an individual taxa. It depends on the metabolic cap capability which, which the whole group can do. And uh, so you can exchange uh, guys uh, in the whole of Bayern, but having the same fitness or the same, the same reading uh, still conserved. Your last slide was shocking. The rumen microbiome is a morphogenetic field. Mm -hmm. That is very heavy. Uh, <laughs> uh, as a, this is what I'm working on now. This is so. This is all. Yeah. yeah. Let me let me ask you. I mean, it's fantastic because it's thought provoking. Um, however, as you know better than everybody on this earth, uh, these classical experiments on morphogenetic fields, on limb development, and all this kind of thing. The experimental evidence for that were transplantation experiments or actually depletion experiments. If you take away this little butt, then no limb is developing. And if you put it ectopically, an extra limb will develop. Mm -hmm. Now, the rumen microbiome cannot be a morphogenetic field because you can grow up germ-free cows and actually people in, I think, Czechia did that uh, after, the, mm -hmm. after the war or something. And the cow, I, I'm, that's a question to you. I think the little cow has at least a rumen anlage. There will mm -hmm. be, yes. so then what's the point of the morphogenetic field? If the cow develops with a rumen and you say the microbiome is the morphogenetic field, something I miss. Okay, so, the, thank you. Uh, the rumen, I'm, I'm looking at the rumen uh, after it's matured, not, not the maturing rumen. Uh, but yes, there is a rumen. And if you transplant the microbes to somewhere else, you're not going to get a rumen. Uh, what I'm looking at are the interactions of how do you get a stable population? 
uh, and, uh, and what can fit into the population, what is excluded from the population, and what things are come possible in the Leibnizian frame, which things can function together. And it just occurred to me about a month ago that the, uh, the that instead of representing the Rumen possibilities on a uh, uh, fitness landscape, that it could be on, a, on an epigenetic landscape. And that you actually have, you might have, nobody's shown this, some, uh, you know, troughs of attraction. And that uh, these are stable states for, and you might have different stable states for Holstein versus Guernsey. I mean, uh, there may be things that the uh, environment of, the, you know, the cow predisposes towards. And so this is what I'm thinking of is how do you get these microbes? And then you have the microbes supporting the microbes and the microbes supporting and so forth. Uh, one of the things though you mentioned, and we could talk about this later about singer and song, is that when you do this, you can't think of these as disembodied genes. That the you know, they're gram negatives, you know, they're gram positives. And that uh, the winnowing of uh, Virbio fisheri is a, probably a good example because many bacteria have Lux genes, but it's only the Lux genes in Virbio fisheri which will be selected for in Uprimna. And so I think that uh, uh, one can't just think of these as isolated genes, but as genes which have a a history that they're encapsulated in, in going from one place to the next. We have time for one short question. Lisa? Uh, yes. Um, Scott, I, uh, I've been working with Mike Wade on the Vibrio Fisheye case, um, and we, we take it as what we call a demivine. In other words, the dependency, the selection dependency only goes in one direction, right? <laughs> The, yep. the, the, the squid selects very strongly, as you say, um, uh, on the bacteria, but um, because it chooses from a very large pool of bacteria and selects them very strongly. Um, but there isn't any selection going on in the other direction. It's, 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 it's not, um, th th there's no evidence that there's selection going on in the other direction. So we call that, it a but That's not true. That's um, not true. We can't find it in the literature. Um, so Look up Kramer et al. Uh, cell host and microbe. So what the microbe does is it attaches, you know, it's a bunch of, of bacteria in the surrounding seawater and the microbe attaches to the host cells and says something to the host cells that causes the host to change gene expression that pours out a whole bunch of stuff. So it's a, it's a complex dialogue. So uh, I can, if you want to, I can send you that paper. That, that would be terrific. We've scoured the literature trying to find an effect in the other direction. Yeah. We weren't able to find it. Um, okay. so that, that's what my question was. Um, we, we, we've, been, we've been looking all over for this, um, trying to find an effect in the other direction that yeah. would indicate selection in the other direction. That's great. Thank you so much. They're um, responsible for setting up their own chemo uh, kind of bios gradient that brings the bacteria into the library. I see. Yeah. Anyway. I'll, I'll talk to you. Terrific, great, great. I'd love to talk. This whole thing is to network all of us. <laughs> uh, no, that's wonderful, wonderful. Um, because we've been trying to figure this out. And that, that was my question, Scott, was do you know about, um, well, so I got my question answered. But I also wondered um, what, what you do with cases that have you know, very strong selection in one direction and weaker selection in the other direction. How, how do you think about those balancing, that balancing of, dependencies do you do you, um uh do you contemplate that ever yeah yeah uh and and i you know i guess i think of you know kind of na nature as uh analog rather than digital uh to some degree and and that uh you know there's going to be a gradient of yes some are going to be you know dependent you know in one direction and some are going to be very mutual uh I figure, you know, it, uh, it, it is so, 
it, it is so dependent on the context and what level you're looking at. Again, I'm thinking of the root tortoise example or the example of uh, uh, the soybean bug, uh, which gets some, its bacteria from the soil. And after using insecticide, the, the bacteria become resistant to the insecticide and propagate. And now the uh, uh, bug has eaten this bacteria and now is resistant to the insecticide. Uh, and so it's a one directional thing. I don't, right. uh, uh, but it seems like you now have an evolutionary niche that the, yeah. that yeah. the bug can go into. Yeah, it's a new niche, right? It's new niche. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's fabulous, it's fabulous stuff. I loved your talk, thank you. Thank you, thanks, thanks so much. For, do you have a very quick question? It seems for that you raise your hand. There we go. Uh, sorry, I was muted. Um, <laughs> this is a comment about the conversation between Lisa and Margaret just now. Um, it seems to me the question is whether or not the vibrios have uh, are under selection to interact with the squid, right, or not, and that has to do with the population size of the vibrios. When I think there was a paper by Ned Ruby, um, maybe I, maybe I not up on this literature that that claimed that the population of vibrios that could be recruited was so large that the selective advantage to vibrios of interacting positively with squid was was negligible. Is that well, that's what our argument has been so far. That's what our paper. There's, there's no reason. There's no reason for the vibrio to want to get along with the squid because there's so many vibrios out there. But yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'd like to send you our paper so far our draft. Um, forward and see what you think oh, of the sure. that's the argument so far is that the population of Vibrio is so large that the minimal number that actually interact with the squid is so small and we do the numbers on it um, to show how small it is. So yeah. Yeah, yeah that's so, that's, that's, that's really true. Um, the I often say to the microbiologists that Vibrio fisheye is enslaved <laughs> and they don't yeah. like that. Um, but the there are, you know, there are tremendous strain very strain differences in, and some of the strains do better in the light organ. Their fitness is better in the light organ, and some strains their fitness is better in the surrounding seawater. You know, so so there's there is a lot of there there are a lot of dimensions to this. I guess is the is yeah. The yeah. Is it is it is it known, for instance, what the rate of cell division is for vibrios in the seawater versus in the light organ? Yeah, they ha they have a tendency to go into a viable non-culturable state uh, in the in the surrounding seawater, whereas in the light organ they are ninety percent of them are vented every day and they come back to ten to the eleventh every day and then they go ninety percent of them out every day at dawn. So it's a big it's a big chemostat uh, in there. And the, and, and the light does the light organ kind of act as an incubation chamber, you know? For yeah, the incubation and, and, of collection experiment, Scott. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And the yeah. adults have the adults have uh, or the juveniles have tremendous habitat loyalty, and that is to say, when they hatch, um, they stay around where their parents are because the fisheries very abundant. As you get a f as farther and farther away from fisheries population or uh, uh, populations dense populations of fisheries, it's hard for the babies to get colonized. So there's a lot of biogeography um, associated with the symbiosis as well. Anyway. Or sort of almost intermediate neighborhood kind of stuff, isn't it? Um, I guess it's my role to say that we're a little bit late, so let's thank again Scott. That was that was great. So again, I'm going to try to thank you. Appreciate this. It. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. Um, okay, so I forgot to say that. Uh, for Twitter fans, there's uh, probably a hashtag. I guess Lin Xu is, as usual, uh, the, 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 the person who is running it. So if you want to go on Twitter, I think you can hear about what we, we've been saying here. Um, yeah, so now it's uh, uh, time to um, listen to John Rothgarden. So John is a professor emerita at Stanford University. She's also adjunct professor at the University of Hawaii. So this is where she is at the moment, as I said before. She's an ecologist and evolutionary biologist. Um, she has worked on many uh, important topics, including social selection as an alternative to sexual selection. 
she's the author of a book published in 2009, I think, The Genial Gene Deconstructing Darwinian uh, Selfishness. And she has also worked on the uh, uh, notion of uh, biological individuality, like uh, Scott did as well. And um, in the last few years, I would say five years roughly, John has worked on mathematical models of uh, holobiont evolution. So this is really a great pleasure, John, to uh, now listen to your talk. Uh, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Yes. Oh, great. Well, thanks so much for everyone uh, participating and for you, Thomas, for organizing this. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity. So just to let you know where I'm coming from on this, uh, I was at a conference in Israel with uh, Scott and Lisa and uh, Elena. Um, and the the uh, I was enchanted by the idea that uh, Alana uh, was talking about, especially of a uh, of a hollow genome and the notion that the genome uh, is ex extensible and that it's not a static entity within an, an organism. And I was at this conference lecturing about uh, social behavior and birds and things like that, and and I was asked, what do you have against microorganisms? <laughs> I said, I don't have anything against microorganisms. I never think about them. <laughs> and I had lunch with Elena and she was talking about how uh, she felt they needed a, a model uh, for how selection on holobionts would work and how a hologenome would work. And that they couldn't get any acceptance of the idea uh, unless there was, particularly in evolutionary circles, unless there was a model. So I began to think about this problem uh, as a modeler rather than as a participant in the primary research in this area. So what I have to offer to you then are some models which uh, show the plausibility of holobiont selection and the plausibility of the notion of a hologenome uh, and hopefully that'll be helpful. So the, um, uh, there we go. Now the objective of this modeling would be to develop a theory for the hologenome that parallels the existing theory for uh, natural selection uh, operating on a, a classical genome. And a theory would proceed by starting with a state description of what, uh, in classical genetics, for example, would be starting with a state, gen state variable describing the gene pool. And then the equations would predict the state of the gene pool after one generation based on the mating system and the um, uh, and the natural selection. So to develop a, a similar concept or a similar line of uh, argument for hologenomes, we would need to have a concept of a hologenotype whose frequency distribution would then change through time. And it seems as though the most natural representation of a hologenotype would be as a nested hierarchy as shown here. Um, and so you have the holobiont itself uh, delimited by the host, the boundaries of the host. And within the host, there are several genomes, the, the genome within the host nucleus, as well as the genomes within various microorganisms inside. And then the microorganisms themselves had, could have different allelic variations within them. And so you would represent that as a list of lists or a hierarchical data structure as illustrated here. And this would be an example of two particular holobionts, um, which differ in this case in the uh, identity of the taxa, which are in green. And furthermore, there's a question of whether these taxa themselves could be described as niches 
uh, or is occupying a niche. And a niche in this case could either be a physical location within the host or it could be a biochemical function, a functional niche. Now, given that that's what a hologenotype is, uh, we can look at uh, uh, simple versions of it. We don't need uh, a full-fledged uh, 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 hologenotype to begin with. Now, a lot of the uh, discussion when I began with this was focused on arguing that there was in fact a lot of, that there was, it was claimed that there was a lot of vertical transmission. So although one could speak of, uh, going back right here to the hologenotype, um, one could speak of these genes as being added to, so to speak, the genes that are already in the nucleus. Um, it, the mode of transmission of these uh, uh, extra genes, the genes in the microbes, has to be different than that of the mode of transmission of the genes in the nucleus. And, but, but the discussion when I was introduced uh, to this issue was focusing on trying to show that there was as much vertical transmission as possible. And hence, my first modeling involved a life cycle which relied on vertical transmission. And this would be an example of a, a vertical uh, transmission life cycle right here, in which you have a number of holobionts characterized by a different number of microorganisms in them. Then they, there's a limited amount of migration between them so that each one uh, contributes a tiny amount called M into a transfer pool, which is redistributed back among them. Then these uh, go, then once they have their uh, hologenotype, whoops, uh, then uh, they uh, grow. So, so the uh, empty hosts are initially colonized, and then there's a within life uh, generation growth of the microorganisms, the, the proliferation stage. And then once that's over with, then there's the vertical transmission stage. And here, uh, hosts or holobionts with say five um, microorganisms give rise to progeny and so forth. And the, in the case of the symbiotic microorganisms, they give rise, the ones with a lot of microorganisms give rise to a lot of progeny. And then this goes around and around. Now, uh, as I got into this literature more, it was clear that there was a problem with uh, agreeing that this, uh, uh, life cycle was reasonable because of the assumption of vertical, ver vertical transmission. And that even though there were processes leading to effective vertical transmission, as, as Scott talked about, um, it was clear that in something like corals, and, and I'm after all at a marine station, and think about corals, um, there the, the uh, zoosanthellae are very widely distributed in the, or in the uh, ocean and you can't possibly think about vertical transmission as being all that common. So I bit the bullet and tried to see whether or not a model could be developed that really endorsed full out horizontal transmission, not just a little horizontal transmission and mostly vertical, but say entirely horizontal. And that gives rise to this type of life cycle right here in which the uh, microorganisms are all contributed to a microbial source pool, and the juvenile empty hosts are uh, uh, enter a host source pool. And then there's a sampling process by which the hosts are colonized by the microbes. And I chose Poisson sampling right here as the simplest sampling process you could use. And so uh, in my, uh, just keeps hitting, sorry about that. Uh, in my last paper uh, uh, ab about the comparison of m vertical versus horizontal transmission, uh, I talk about whether or not uh, this uh, selection on the holobion will work for either of these two cases. Now this is a, a computer iteration of that, uh, of those life cycles. So you go around the life cycle and you go through it and you find out what the 
of population is at time t from time t plus from time t going to time t plus one and then t plus two and so forth. So you walk around the life cycles and this is what you get. In the case of uh, vertical transmission, if this is the initial distribution of hologenotype frequencies, and if the microbe is a mutualist, then through time you see that compared to the initial condition, the population uh, uh, accumulates the population be, um, becomes uh, a population of holobionts becomes characterized by having a large number of uh, symbiotic microbes in them. And if you were to look visually at the uh, population of holobionts, you would actually see it getting greener, so to speak, through time. And on the other hand, uh, for horizontal transmission, where if you start out with a Poisson distribution, of uh, um, mutualistic microbes, and then through time under holobiont selection, you again get the whole population shifting to holobionts, which have more and more uh, uh, mutualists in them. So I concluded from that that holobiont selection uh, was effective uh, with either mode of transmission although the underlying evolutionary dynamics were somewhat different. And in the course of having my manuscript on this reviewed, it became clear that there was a connection between this and the earlier literature on uh, multi-level selection. And the scheme, this scheme over here, a vertical transmission corresponds uh, almost exactly to multi-level selection too, as uh, for example, Okasha writes, Whereas, uh, holobiont select, whereas horizontal transmission leads to multi-level selection one, sort of, uh, but in multi-level selection one, as it's usually stated, the uh, host doesn't evolve. The host could actually be an inanimate uh, feature of the environment within which the uh, microbes live. So this is, if, if you want to make it, if you feel it's necessary to make a connection to prior literature, you can consider evolution via horizontal transmission as a, a modified form of micro, of um, multi-level selection one. So uh, I obviously didn't want to leave it at this point because here uh, the selection is only for numbers of uh, offspring rather than uh, uh, or numbers of microbes rather than for the identity of those microbes. And the number of microbes is in effect the gene copy number. If you consider a microbe a gene, like a gene, then a large number of microbes uh, equates to a uh, high copy number. So in, in the manuscript I sent you, which is uh, largely a, a set of annotated notes uh, for uh, research that's in progress. Um, I've now considered uh, microbial strains and host alleles with genetic variation. And I've made two main assumptions right here, which are really key. One is to allow the microbial community to come to equilibrium. Uh, before this, if I don't do this, then I really am stuck doing computer, computer solutions of the modeling. This, this makes a huge difference. And then the other assumption is, to, is one of uh, binomial sampling, uh, coming, coming from the assumption of a, a dilute microbial source pool. Now, it doesn't mean that all the microbes, as uh, was just mentioned, there are a great many microbes out in the seawater. But the question is, how dilute is this, the seawater for these particular strains right here. And I'm assuming these are dilute enough that, uh, that any given host has a chance of being colonized by one brown or uh, by a brown, by a green, or by both. And if so, then we could have my, uh, binomial sampling leading to the uh, colonization of the of the empty hosts. So that's the scheme right here. We're getting selection 
on uh, the holobiont depending on the number in this case of strain one, in this case on the number in strain two, and in this case on the number of, so this would be a, a polymorphic holobiont with a certain number of strain one and a certain number of strain two, which are obtained from the ecological model uh, describing what the equilibrium community looks like. Now, uh, just so that, so that we're on the same page here, let me remind you of what the formulas look like from standard population genetics in a population genetic textbook, where you'd have allele one corresponding to this gene frequency, allele two to one minus that. You'd have three fitnesses. And then you'd have something called the marginal fitness of allele one, which is the fitness of allele one in uh, homozygotes plus the fitness of the allele two of the allele one in heterozygotes. And similarly for the other one, the other allele. And then the overall population fitness would in turn be the average of these. And then the gene frequency at time t plus one would be the marginal fitness over the allele, over the total fitness, the ratio of this. And you can see that you'd get equilibrium here when W1 equals W2. That is, if the marginal fitness of both genes are equal, then the denominator and the numerator will cancel out to giving you one. So that's really key here, is that this equality of marginal fitnesses is the criterion for equilibrium. Now, if you work your way around this cycle right here, you come up with equations of the same form, but with one really neat uh, difference that the fitnesses of a of a uh, of a microbe are products of the population size it attains within a host times the fitness of the holobiont as a whole. So you get a a, a kind of K selection going on within host and an R selection between hosts, and you wind up getting four fitness coefficients for the uh, microbes. So I'm calling these the uh, uh, multi-level fitnesses. And uh, from those equations, you can start out with different initial conditions of, uh, hope of uh, microbe, initial, different initial conditions of the microbe frequencies. And you see that they approach an equilibrium. And that equilibrium is associated with equality of the marginal microbe fitnesses, as I was just indicating. Now, uh, you can also look at, of course, uh, evolution in the nuclear uh, part of the hologenome. And here there would be then two different host alleles. And the equations for these are just the, since this is just usual vertical transmission, the equations for these are the usual equations from population genetics. And the only wrinkle here is that a given microbe, say the green microbe in a uh, A1A1 host comes to a different, equal, different population size, different equilibrium size than it does in a heterozygote host or a homozygote A2A2 host. And these are those, uh, these are the corresponding equations. And as expected, of course, there's a, an equilibrium frequency in the different host alleles, and again, an equilibrium condition representing the marginal fitness equality. Now, so you put them all together, and I hope you see the uh, flow of the uh, derivation here. We now are going to have uh, host alleles and different strains of microbes. And, and the, what's really neat about this is it shows a parallel character to, to, the random, to the mating system, which is random union of gametes from the gamete pool and microbial colonization from the microbial source pool. So that this is, this mechanism is the source of recombination for the microbial component of the hologenome. And this, of course, is where you get recombination in the nuclear component of the source pool. Whoops. 
and uh, and they all pile in here. So the notation gets a bit complicated since you're tracking both alleles and strains, but you get get the idea here. And for those of you who are watching on a uh, uh, a desktop, you might be able to see the formulas, but the main idea right here is that these are formulas that are similar to those I showed you before just for the um, for the microbes. These are the formulas like those I showed you before for the host alleles and you put them together and you get two equations. One for the change in uh, microbe, free, microbe strain frequency and the other for the strain change in allele host frequency. And the only twist here is, of course, because there's so many kinds of hologenotypes, um, you get a lot of different microbial selection coefficients. And, and the, the marginal fitnesses are always averages. Um, so, so you get the marginal fitness of say strain one is p times the average over the different allele types and then this times the average over the allele types so to understand the dynamics of the host part of the host alleles you're averaging over the micro microbiome and to understand the the strains you're averaging over the host alleles you have a double layer of averaging going on, which is what makes it complicated looking. But, but logically, it's really quite simple. And uh, because it's a complicated dynamic with two variables now, you can have different equilibria at the corners right here, and you could have an equilibrium in the middle. And a complete analysis of this model would involve looking at the stability of all the equilibria. And, uh, there's an equilibrium gene frequency, which would, let me back up here. So when both the microbiome and the host alleles are at equilibrium, you get a P and a Q uh, equilibrium point, which would be represented in a graph like this with the, the microbes in a horizontal axis, the host alleles in the vertical axis, and then you get the equilibrium point. And these are trajectories right here from different initial conditions that lead to that equilibrium. Now, um, what you might ask is maximized by uh, uh, holobiont evolution with allelic and strain variation. And it is the product of the marginal fitness equalities. So this little point up here is where, is where the uh, holobiont marginal fitness is equal for both the strains and for the host alleles and it comes to that point and you can, this is another view of it from below. Now it's important that the, what is not being maximized by holobiont evolution is the mean holobiont fitness as a whole. So you, so you can't conclude that selection on the holobiont is going to lead overall to maximum holobiont fitness. Um, and, and this turns out to be reminiscent of what, at least I think, reminiscent of the way population genetics works with two, two and more loci. It's been well known that uh, natural selection doesn't lead to fitness maximization with, with more than one locus. And with two loci in particular, and several decades ago, there's a lot of work on that. And, uh, and that's true here. Um, so we have a two component uh, gene pool, or holo, holo gene pool. And finally, uh, the, fr from an evolutionary point of view, the modeling I've been doing is mechanistic in, in Outlook. So it's going, so given that we're working around a, a, an actual um, life cycle diagram, we're coming up with mechanistic equations for how that sort of system would work. And to, uh, to undertake a strategic analysis rather than a mechanistic analysis, we need to have some concept of what's being 
maximized or, or what the objective is of, of a strategy. And that's where this notion of a, a evolutionarily stable strategy originally due to Maynard Smith is relevant. And we can adapt that here to make a holo stable strategy. And we can ask under what conditions, on what type of phenotype would lead to this equilibrium being stable and everything else being unstable. So that a phenotype whose strains and genes caused by this, the strain and genes uh, at, this, at this point, so what, what phenotype would be such that uh, nothing, such that it couldn't be invaded by any other strain, type of strain or strain ratio or any other allele type. And you can compute the conditions under which this equilibrium over here is stable to the introduction either of uh, uh, another kind of allele or another kind of microbe. And if you develop uh, a phenotype model in which, um, and that's not a genetic model, it's a phenotype model. It's where uh, this curve, for example, would be the uh, effort expended by the microbe to benefit the host, and this benefit, uh, the effort expended by the host to benefit the microbe. And where they intersect is where um, uh, any phenotype with a different level of host altruistic effort or a different um, uh, microbe altruistic effort could not displace the microbe that's already there or the host allele that's already there. And the, the uh, phenotype that would produce this strategy would then be a holostable strategy and would not be subject to uh, displacement by anything else. So that would, uh, this notion of a holostable strategy then allows one also to think about the evolution of hologenomes in connection with, um, a in terms of a strategic analysis rather than solely with a, uh, uh, a mechanistic analysis. So in conclusion, um, the, from, from the first paper that I've sent you, uh, the hologenotype is a hierarchical data structure. Holobiont selection theory maps the hologenotype distribution at t to t plus one. Holobiont selection works, does work with both vertical and horizontal microbial transmission, although in different ways, with a different underlying mechanistic basis. Holobiont selection with vertical transmission corresponds to multi-level selection two and with horizontal transmission, roughly to multi-level selection one. Now from the second paper, random colonization by microbes is the counterpart of the random union of gametes. And so we're getting um, the mating system being the logical counterpart for nuclear alleles of the um, colonization uh, dynamics for the microbes. And six, multi-level fitness for a microbe combines within host K selection with between host R selection. The hologenome is similar to a two locus genetic system in the sense that uh, the overall fitness isn't maximized. And the host microbiome co-adaptation may express a holostable strategy. And then finally, in the, in the large picture, the hologenome, I think this work shows that the hologenome with holobiont selection can be made evolutionarily rigorous. And holobiont theory is useful because it considers both the host and the microbiome simultaneously. So it's a, a joint theory. And perhaps most contentious, uh, it seems to me that holobionts do not destabilize the notion of individuality. The individuality of a holobiont derives from the
the individuality of the host. And so to use Scott's example of a cow, the cow is a holobion as an individual. It's in, and it's a cat because we can identify the cow. And it doesn't lose its individuality because it has microbes. And similarly, a coral, if a coral polyp is uh, status, it, it, if its status is questionable, it's because the polyp is a member of a colony of other polyps, not because the polyp contains um, zooxanthellae. However, I think that the whole notion of holobionts, with, particularly with horizontal microbe transmission, does destabilize inheritance, the notion of inheritance, by replacing lineal inheritance with collective inheritance. And uh, so thank you very much. And that's what I have to offer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can you um, stop sharing your screen, maybe, if that's OK for you? Yeah, if I can figure out how to do that. Oh, it's up here. Sorry. <laughs> there we are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, now we can upload, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was great. Um, so same method as before, I'm going to try to see who is uh, raising their hands, um, both on your videos and on mine. Or perhaps I can start then. So I, I <clears throat> would like to hear more about the notion of hollow stable strategy because it was new to me. So can you just explain more a little bit what, uh, what it means and, and to what extent, I mean, you said it was connected to other conceptions about evolutionary strategies, but I, don't, I just want to hear more about it because it was new to me, apart of course from what I had read from you. So what, what does it mean exactly? Well, uh, as Maynard Smith discussed, uh, uh, especially, um, it's an evolutionary stable strategy is a phenotype such that any, any phenotype, any other phenotype can't invade when rare, would be the, uh, the way to put it. Uh, so if uh, a height of, say, five feet, were an evolutionarily stable strategy according to some model of optimal heights, then uh, a height of 4.9 feet or 5.1 feet would not be able to enter a population which was already fixed for five feet. So uh, an evolutionary stable strategy gives rise to uh, if, a model in which you can compute an optimal phenotype and have an evolutionary justification for your criterion for optimality. Now, in our case, uh, an evolutionary stable uh, host, micro, an evolutionary stable holobiont would have a, an allele frequency, so that is an A1 to A2 frequency, and also a microbiome that is a strain one and strain two frequency, such that if another strain entered uh, or, or another allele entered, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be able to increase when rare. So it'd be stuck at the, at the edge, so to speak. Does that help? Yes, yes, okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. So it's, but the key thing, though, is that they're both. It's stable both to the introduction of a different strain than the one that's already dominant and, and or the introduction of a different allele than the one that's already dominant. Because the, the allele that's already dominant can't be bettered by any other allele with a coding for a different strata, for a different phenotype. And the strain that's already dominant, can't be invaded by any other strain coding for a different um, expression of that strain on the host, on the holobiont fitness. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay, 
Thank you. Yeah. Um, I see several questions. Andrew. Oh, here, let me, here we go. Makes it feel a little bit more human when we're looking at each other, <laughs> the black right. screen. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I learned so much more just listening to you talk through that than I did from reading the papers. So that was really fantastic. Yeah, sorry um, about that. <laughs> no problem. Um, I, uh, the, the question I have is just about point four. I think I agree with, with e everything that comes in the conclusion. Point four, I'm just curious about the word roughly. So, um, and it came up earlier on. So when you said that uh, um, uh, holobiont sele selection in the model with horizontal inheritance is roughly like MLS1, I'm just curious why you qualify it. I, I would think that there could be a case of MLS1 where you would have community level change. So you could have MLS1 selection on um, what particles making up a collective and then you could have collective level change over time. Um, but that would still, we would just say be exactly MLS1, not roughly MLS1. So I'm just curious what you think of as the difference there between that and holobion selection. If you could say anything more, thank you. <laughs> sure. Well, maybe I'm just being a little strict about it, but uh, when I've gone back to uh, Okasha's writing on this, which I have taken as definitive, um, even though, of course, he cites earlier references to the, to the distinction, um, he's quite clear that the so-called collective in, in uh, multi-level selection one is merely a place in the environment in which the particles can interact and um, in that case evolve cooperation. Right. So, okay. and um, Maynard Smith wrote, wrote a model about, uh, in nature, I believe, about uh, multi-level selection one, and he considered the collectives as being a haystack. And, okay. uh, and the mice were the particles, and the mice were evolving uh, how, how to cooperate so as to produce from from their uh, confined area um, right. a higher output of mice so that you wound up getting the evolution of cooperation of mice because they were confined within these little haystacks where they had to uh, uh, evolve um, cooperation in order to maximize the production of the group right and, and so so the haystack is the counterpart of the host in the holobiont thinking. And of course the host is evolving and the haystack isn't evolving. So that's mm -hmm. the grounds for my distinction, my, my referring to it as roughly. And the question right. is whether you're a lumper or a splitter in a way. Um, <laughs> if, you're a, if you're a splitter, holobiont selection is a new thing. If you're a lumper, then it's just a variant of uh, multi-level selection one. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was going to say thank you. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. Javier. Uh, thank you so much, Joan. Well, uh, I already read your paper and sent you some comments, but I will ask you to ask you the following. Because, well, you said that, of course, this, the equilibrium that is reached can change if you include new alleles in the population or if new strains appear. I was wondering whether you are thinking about extending the model including the following possibility, that those alleles that create the epistatic interaction with the host just happen to become much more dominant in the environment or whatever, just precisely because uh, they, I don't know, they change horizontally in the whole microbiome or they have any kind of those conditions or they can even go and change to the, even to the host genome you know, at some point. Are you thinking of extending the model to something like that? Uh, Probably not. I, I would put that maybe on the list. Um, uh, I mean, it's going to take me a while to, to get this published because uh, I need to convert the manuscript you've been so kind enough to read into a form that's um, more accessible and, and uh, appropriate for a journal. But um, after that, I'm probably going to look at uh, a model with, uh, uh, based on the SIR models for infectious diseases, mm. in which the um, 
the microbes are, are infectious diseases. And, and uh, that would require modifying the, mo the uh, life cycle diagram, of course, to include hosts that are receptive versus infected and, and those that are vulnerable. And it's prompted, of course, by the, the, the epidemic we're going through now. And, uh, and I'm just, you know, I'm modeling motivated out of curiosity because <laughs> I'm retired, you know, <laughs> doing this for fun in a way. <laughs> Not that it's everybody's idea of fun, but, and, and I'm really curious about how holobiont selection could lead to reduction the reduction of virulence, which at the moment is of course being interpreted as a, as a co-evolutionary process. But it's not clear that it is a co-evolutionary process in the sense that the, that the microbe has a distinct gene pool from the host and that the, the gene pools evolve separately from one another, but, but have interact, but have a mutually dependent selection coefficients, which is the setup for a typical uh, um, co-evolutionary model, whereas in fact the the virus and, and the pathogens reside within the host, and yeah. so there is an alignment, therefore, uh, uh, between the host and the microbes, and that might offer a better explanation for the evolution of reduced virulence. Than the sort of hand weaving, hand waving version we currently have based on coevolution, because holobiont selection can lead to coadaptation, and you don't need uh, coevolution to get coadaptation co um, necessarily. I mean, it does lead to coadaptation if it occurs, but coevolution does seem to be really natural to something like a plant pollinator interaction, and uh, you know cases like that where there's uh, uh, where, where the individuals aren't physically united. So mm -hmm. the whole idea, the whole definition of a symbiosis, symbiosis means the host and the guest actually live together uh, as distinct from a mutualist, like a plant pollinator situation where the host and the plant, where there is no host, where the plant and the insect don't actually live together. Of course, in gall wasps and some things they do, but the, uh, um, so the, I, I take the notion of, of physical intimacy and, and living, living together and within one another uh, in the idea of symbiosis as very seriously. And that's what I think underpins the whole of ion uh, thinking here. Okay, thank you. Okay. I have a question by Tyler and then I saw by Pierrick. So it seems that some of you have difficulties raising your hands. So just send me a, uh, a, a text or conversation or any or you know that sort of, sort of thing. So uh, Tyler, thanks so much. Um, I Bye. wonder, going back to the previous discussion about the squid vibrio case, whether yeah. your models have anything to say about um, examples of host microbiome interaction where the population size of the microbes is really really large, like exorbitantly large. Um, so you talked about evolutionary stable, evolutionarily stable strategies, yeah. but one of the things that seems to be stable about the Vibrio case is that the population size of the Vibrio is so large that even if um, there were significant, some significant local selection pressures being exerted by the Vibrio on, um, or being exerted by the squid on the Vibrio, that that wouldn't have much of an effect on the background population of Vibrio. So I'm wondering if that you can factor that in. Um, well, I'd, I don't know. Yeah, I, I could factor it in. Uh, it's very interesting hearing about that. Uh, and so, I mean, there are two issues. One is whether or not the strains of interest are present in large quantities. Um, it's one thing to say that there are a lot of Vibrio, but it's another thing to say that there's specific strains which are relevant to the squid uh, that are present in a large abundance. And so I need a little clarification on that. And the other is that uh, 
the dynamics of the colonization are critical. I mean, a number of the earlier discussion concerned the selection by the host of what microbes are, they allow to, co to colonize them. And I don't have that in the model yet. That probably ought to be there. But um, there's also the sampling process because it's the sampling process that gives rise to the variation among holobionts, which allows for holobiont selection. And the reason I assume the dilute uh, uh, microbial source pool, which I must say I, I have thought was realistic also, um, is that if you wind up getting each juvenile um, uh, squid colonized by the same species of, of Vibrio, of, then, um, then they all start out the same and there's no variation among holobionts for holobiont selection to act on. So even if there are a lot of Vibrio in the water, um, the question of how that translates into the distribution of initial microbiomes in the in, in the, the juvenile hosts. Um, and, uh, and as I said, it's similar in principle to a mating system. You can really screw up natural selection by varying the mating system all over the place. And you can screw up uh, holobiont selection by varying the colonization uh, sampling process quite a bit. Um, so I, I'm, I guess you could say I'm evading your question a bit, but I'm mulling it over. That is okay. Thank you. Is that helpful? <laughs> yeah. 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 Tyler, Warren, can I just clarify one thing? So um, when you say Vibrio fisheri populations are large, um, they're somewhere around 100 cells, 100 to, in, in sometimes in the sediment, there'll be 100 cells per mil against a background of a million others. And you can you can predict animal populations in an area by taking a baby squid and asking whether or not it gets colonized. In other words, you know, it's, it's really um, uh, populations of Vibrio fisheri in, a, in, a, in an area. So around Oahu, around Oahu, there are bits of water areas that will not colonize the squid. And so that, uh, but in Kaneohe Bay, you know, yeah. estimated to be 45,000 hosts. And so, you know, putting out 10 to the 11th bacteria every, every one of those every day, you get a huge, uh, you know, it gets up to a hundred of Vibrio fisheri in a background of 10 to the sixth. So it's not a huge number and it's dependent, at least in Hawaii, on the presence of the adults. Well, well, that's really interesting uh, because I must say a hundred in a milliliter doesn't sound like a huge number to me. I, is no. that fair? Yeah, that's, that's right. And if you put a juvenile in, in natural seawater, um, you, you, they will become colonized um, over two days. And what we do in the lab is we give them a lot, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. we, we, because we want them to get colonized and we're doing experiments yeah. with them yeah. and students want to have a life. Um, you uh, give them a thousand cells per mil. Yeah, and yeah, in yeah. hours, if you give them a thousand cells per mil in a background of a million others, um, in a, in a, it's, it's actually fascinating because the babies are so small that the Reynolds numbers are so low that it's amazing that they get colonized, I have to say. At all, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Well, thank you for that, yeah. Jerick? Yes, thank you for your talk. So my question is with the horizontal model. And so if it's uh, MLS1, as you might uh, certainly know that some people like question the reality of MLS1 as a real notion of group selection or multi-level selection. And actually, even in Okasha, he has uh, uh, the H chapter is about the evolution of individuality and where he says that in, when you're in a situation of MLS1, you can see things either as an individual or as independent uh, individuals. And so what 
I wanted to know what you would respond to this if uh, if there is scope to just see this as two uh, entities or two two types of entities. Why would we choose to call this a holobiont? Is there any other uh, reason to do it other than perhaps the the fact that we can observe that they behave like a collective? Well. Um... As, as you know, I, uh, I agree to your earlier point that, uh, that you've made in your previous writings that there has to be a, um, a, converge, a uh, shared interest uh, uh, between the holobion, between the, the, the uh, participants of the holobion. And uh, similar actually to a remark that Lisa made, in the modeling that I've done, you, you see a shared interest uh, by the microbe in the survival of the host so that you get this coefficient of fitness, which is the carrying capacity within the host times the host's survival or the, the host's fecundity. Um, so, that you, so that you get a multi-level fitness expression for the um, for the micro, but you don't get that for the host. So the ho host's, ho host fitness is depending simply on the number of microbes, but not on their, their fitness. Whereas the, the microbes fitness depending on its own within host, as well as the between host fitness. So um, this shared, uh, th this partial alignment, so I call this a partial alignment of interest. So there's not a total alignment of interest, but, uh, so I think it qualifies as a holobiont by your criterion in that regard. And then the others, in the remark you just made, you suggested that they look like a unit and function as a unit. And that is relevant. I mean, if you look at a cow, it's a holobiont. I mean, there it is in front of you. <laughs> if you look at a carl, it's in front of you. So I, I don't think we need to be th very theoretical about that. Uh, it, it, does that speak to your point? Maybe, maybe I think for, in some case there will be, yeah, it will be indisputable, but I'm more interested in how, how we are going to make a, when there will be marginal case, for instance, where our intuition says, ah, it might be not, it might not be a holobiont, but according to some kind of independent criteria, we could say, well, look, actually, it is a holobiont. And that's kind of the case I'm interested in. Yeah, I mean, and I, I, as, I, I appreciate, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, I appreciate that point. But the, mm -hmm. the holobionts I'm modeling are one in which we have endosymbiosis involved. And, and so the microbe is living within the host and their fates are interlocked and their selection events are even synchronized uh, in most cases. And in the model, they're completely synchronized. So um, if you have a, a, a symbiosis where um, it's an, an exosymbiosis or where the symbiont is outside the body of the host, th then I think they might be the cases you're finding difficult to classify. I is that right? Uh, yes and no. I think clearly if it's, uh, if it's, if the microbe is, is inside, it's, it's gonna probably make it more aligned, but I think when the, the microbe is facultative, uh, the, there have been claim about holobionts even in those cases. And uh, when there is horizontal transmission, and the, I, think, I think that this case will in some case lead to some marginal case or some case where we don't know whether we should consider them as holobiont or not. And I think that for me, having a kind of independent criteria, which would be different from saying just, look, we can see that they are holobiont, would be, um, uh, would be, would be beneficial for, for the claim about holobiont. Well, f fair enough. Um, so so I, don't, I guess I don't really know yet how much, how big a problem it is. And, um, the uh, for facultative uh, uh, 
uh, whole, for facultative um, microbes or guest species. Um, what, what would it mean to, mean to be facultative? Which is, is, I mean, the, the question ha has come up in, uh, as to whether um, a, a microbe should or should not bother colonizing a host. And uh, because it, if, the, if a microbe can live by itself outside in the seawater, and, and if it could also live inside a host, then uh, which, which should it do? Uh, my hunch about this is that it should do one or the other, that uh, it's not too, not too likely that, uh, I mean, if one is better than the other, it should do that one. And, uh, and it's possible that you could get an equilibrium coming out in which the net survival uh, for a free living microbe for, compared to the survival of one that was living in a host you know, worked out to be the same. But if one is consistently better than the other, then they should just go that way. And, um, and so I'm not sure uh, whether or not a facultative microbe uh, is particularly an uh, endosymbiotic facultative mi microbe is, um, is, is a big problem. Now, for an uh, ectosymbiotic microbe, like the barnacle on a, on a uh, whale or something like that, uh, you know, I'm not certainly not disposed to think of the barnacles on uh, and a whale together as constituting a whole abiance. I mean, the, the whale is a platform for, for, for and a piece of space for the barnacle to live on. And barnacles in the intertidal zone, at least, are usually considered to be space limited, although <laughs> only in locations of high recruitment. But um, uh, and and you said. And my, my feeling is that you have to look at these cases in detail. You're interested in a general criterion, and we'd say, like a litmus test, and say that if the host does this, and if the uh, um, uh, microbe does that, then, then aha, it's a whole abiant. But um, I, I don't, I, I think that, that as you get data, you build a case that it's a whole abiant. You say, is there an alignment of interest, uh, at least a partial alignment of interest? That seems to me to be really key. And then you go, well, is there functional inter interdependency, which would help explain why uh, or, or represent an outcome of the alignment of interest? And you, and you work up a list of characteristics and say, okay, and then you know, put your beer down on the table and say, okay, I hereby declare it's a whole abiant. And then if the person next to you in the bar says, no, I disagree, then go ahead and have a fight. <laughs> okay, I, I think it's, a, uh, unless Pierrick, you have something very short to say. No, 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 it's a, thank you. <laughs> it, and it's, we, we already have talked, so yeah, I'm not gonna monopolize. But, it's, but it's, it's very good that you share some of your previous conversations uh, with everyone. So that's, that's very, very interesting. Um, thank you very much, Joan. That was really great. Thank you. Um, we are now um, going to listen to Ford, Ford Doolittle. Um, so, as you all know, Ford is a Professor Emeritus at Dalhousie University in Halifax, uh, in Canada. He's an evolutionary and molecular biologist. He's a member of the uh, American Academy, well, U.S. Academy of Science. Um, his domains of expertise are genomics, molecular phylogeny, gene transfer, of course. Um, uh, Ford has worked on uh, the Gaia hypothesis uh, with different views over the years. Uh, also on the notion of, uh, I, I love this picture, also on the notion of uh, function, especially with regards to the ENCODE project. And more recently, uh, including in uh, uh, collaborations, uh, Ford has uh, started to develop some uh, views and sometimes some critiques about the uh, holobiont notion. And I would like to add that, of course, Ford has interacted with uh, several philosophers of science over the year. He even used much of his uh, 
money in a, in a big grant to fund uh, some philosophers. Uh, so he has worked with uh, Maureen O'Malley and with um, uh, Andrew and Tyler and others, uh, and uh, Austin Booth, for example, uh, just to give some examples of them. So Ford, it's a pleasure to now listen to your talk about Darwini Darwinizing Holobias. Thank you. Um, can, can you all hear me? Yes. OK. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm older than I look, apparently. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, the first two speakers were uh, what I would call holobiont proponents, I guess. And I'm probably known as a holobiont critic or skeptic. Um, I can see that there are grounds for agreement between us, nevertheless. But I do consider myself to be what I would call a spiritual Darwinian. Um, that is to say, I'm constantly trying to make... Um, contemporary phenomena consistent with what I imagine to be what Darwin would agree with if he were alive today. And so that's what I'm really trying to do with the case of holobionts, because I think that Darwin would probably not accept the current uh, hologenome concept of evolution as a legitimately Darwinian concept, but then I'm hoping that fiddling it the way that I am trying to do would convince him that it is. So in a sense, I'm trying to do the same thing, but from a different perspective. Um, so I'm thinking, oh, my wife is just bringing me a cup of tea here, I think. Oh my, and a cookie as well, sorry. Um, so I'm going to be following um, the lead of a bunch of philosophers and um, mostly philosophers, biologists too, that come before me, um, who I think are part of what I would consider to be the Darwinian lineage or the tradition of thinking about um, natural selection. Obviously, there are other ways to think about natural selection, some of them represented by other people here. Um, but I'm thinking this is probably the mainstream of thinking about Darwinian natural selection. So my outline, what I'm going to talk about are these things in terms of Darwinizing holobionts. I'm going to remind us of what is the hologenome theory of evolution, um, originally uh, coined by the, uh, by the Rosenbergs. Um, I, I see a problem with it. So several of us, mostly biologists, had objected to the whole, whole genome theory of evolution. I'll say what those problems are. There'll be somewhat uh, a reviewing of the talks that went before, particularly Jones. Um, then I will say that the solutions that are proposed by, um, by proponents of the whole about, um, hypothesis are, are really not quite enough. They don't to my mind, Darwinize the holobiont notion well enough, but I'm hoping that some of the solutions that are proposed by me, and particularly now Drew, um, might 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 be submitted to Darwinize the notion of holobiont. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, so uh, I think probably everybody here knows the hologenome theory of evolution was uh, formulated by the Rosenbergs in uh, 2008 about. Well, that long ago, um, I'll just read the quote here. We present here the whole genome theory of evolution, which considers the whole biont, the animal or plant with all its associated microorganisms, as a unit of selection and evolution. It's the unit of selection and evolution that um, upset quite a large number of people, particularly me and, and uh, Nancy Moran and Angela Douglas, um, because we didn't think that it qualified as unit of selection, having uh, what we think is a mainstream Darwinian view of what that term means, which is pretty much kind of like a replicator, but I'll say more about that in a minute. So um, really, I think there, there are two parts of the holobiont theory. There is the recognition of the importance of symbiosis, and, and Scott talked about that um, in his talk and um, has published several papers on that, this one I particularly like. Um, and, and he claims, uh, ma he makes several statements, which I, I don't disagree with. Um, recognizing the holobiont, the multicellular eukaryote plus its colonies of persistent symbionts as a critically important unit of anatomy, development, physiology, immunology, and evolution opens up a new, opens up a new, opens up new investigative avenues and conceptually challenges the way in which the biological subdisciplines have heretofore characterized living entities. I would agree with that. Um, and this is a new paradigm for biology. That's perhaps what I'm disagreeing with. But so it seems to me that we've, we've, we've discovered quite a lot in the last little while. And I think the reason that we discovered that in the last five or so years is due to several factors. Um, technological advance, um, the 
the ability to sequence the entire uh, collection of genomes in a particular community, uh, and, and in fact, to do that much more easily than we might uh, individualize uh, culture and, and purify the microbes that are involved. But basically, that's an impossible task, whereas sequencing everything is now a very easy and cheap task. Um, and this is what I call metagenomics, now often called microbiomics, and it's it's really a product of the last five years or less of rapid sequencing advance. There's also the theoretical neglect of microbes. I think Maureen O'Malley and John Dupre in particular, but many other people have uh, argued that, you know, evolutionary theory is basically the theory of uh, animal evolution and possibly a little bit of plant evolution and, and microbes, which are actually most of the biomass on the planet and most of the history of life are neglected by uh, philosophers of biology, which is true. Then there are the advances in microbial ecology, which are um, have been um, to some extent largely due to Norman Pace, I'd say, in the use of molecular methods to assess the diversity of microbial communities in nature, including those in ourselves. And then that the last part is the biomedical uh, enthusiasm for microbial involvement in, in many of the processes that Scott talked about um, and, and the importance of um, that. Am I still audible and everything up to you guys? Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah we, can, we yeah. can hear you. Okay. <laughs> this is actually very difficult to lecture just to your slides without having an audience that you can see. But. Yeah. So my second part of my talk, uh, what's the problem with um, the whole bio uh, or the whole genome theory of evolution, and um, I'd say the problem is, and, and so we've already discussed this in a way before, but I'm obliged to talk about it again, is that the holobionts are a mixed bag. Things that are called holobionts are a mixed bag of things from um, those which exhibit pretty strictly vertical inheritance, like the aphid Buchner uh, um, symbiosis, which involves the transmission from the mother aphid to the daughter aphid of uh, the same uh, symbionts, so that the, that the symbionts of the progeny are the progeny of the symbionts of the parent, basically, um, to something that we might call intimate neighborhood inheritance, which I would say was probably true of me because I was delivered vaginally rather than by cesarean section from my mother, so I probably inherited my mother's microbiome, but now that I'm 78 years old, I probably don't have any of the microbes that I inherited from my mother, and I've acquired my entire microbiome, probably from the community and from my food and from my, from my dog, for instance. So I say that for my microbiomes or holobionts on the left-hand side of this picture, there's not a problem between um, skeptics and proponents of the holobiont hypothesis, but there is uh, on the right-hand side for the horizontally inherited um, holobionts situations. And um, again, um, I think this is somewhat of a repeat of what Joan Hofgarten talked about, but I will just go over it again because, so for vertical inheritance, it's the case, and so H stands for host and uh, S stands for symbionts. The symbionts of the progeny are the progeny of the symbionts of the parent of the host, as it were, um, whereas for extreme horizontal inheritance, and that's what I'm modeling here, um, we might imagine that there's a generation, the succession of hosts and and progeny and progeny of the hosts, and then they have a collection of symbionts within them, different species of symbionts, and basically what happens is that the host releases its symbionts into a common pool, and the pool of symbionts mixes around, and then the uh, progeny of the host recruits a fresh collection of microbes from the pool randomly, as it were. So they're released to and recruited from randomly from the environment, uh, the environmental pool. And I would say that on the left-hand side, we can have evolution by natural selection. That's just fine. But on the right-hand side, we don't have evolution by natural selection as holobionts. So the holobionts are not units of selection. So what do I mean by that? And now I'm just going to um, reiterate some of the tenets of what I could consider to be mainstream Darwinian thinking. So part of that would be uh, what's called Lewinton's recipe. Um, first step that there, there are three components of Lewinton's recipe. There is variation in phenotypic properties that too that variation is partly heritable so that individuals resemble the relations more than they resemble unrelated individuals. In particular, offspring resemble their parents, the principle of heredity. That's the important part that offspring resemble their parents for me. 
And three, the different variants leave different numbers of offspring because of their properties. Fitness cashed out as differential reproduction. And Lewinton said all three conditions are necessary as well as sufficient for evolution by natural selection, which I think I would agree with, with modifications that I will introduce in a minute. And Peter Godfrey Smith, who I would say is, is more Darwinian than Darwin, um, would, ar would argue the same way. And uh, this particular quote I like because it makes three different points in one paragraph or one couple of sentences. Evolution by natural selection is change in a population owing to variation, heredity, and differential reproductive success or fitness. That would be Lewinton's recipe again. Um, then the blue part, the criteria required are abstract. Genes, cells, social groups, and species can all in principle enter into changes of this kind. Uh, that would be multi-level selection theory, um, the kind that we've talked about before. And uh, the lastly, for any objects to be units of selection in this sense, however, they must be connected by parent offspring relations. They must have the capacity to reproduce. So uh, Godfrey Smith's definition of units of selection involves reproduction as a unit, uh, and as does mine, or at least it does until we get to the last part of my talk. So then if we go back to the two extreme types of holobionts, the problem uh, with holobiont thinking is represented here on that same picture with words put on top of it. On the left-hand side with vertical inheritance, the holobionts reproduce together as holobionts. They show heritable variation in fitness and parent-offspring relations. It's okay for evolution by natural selection as Peter Godfrey Smith or um, Richard Lewinton would have it. What on the right-hand side, holobionts do not reproduce together as holobionts. Each new holobiont is instead assembled randomly from the pool released by the previous generation of holobionts. So offspring holobionts resemble their own parent hol holobionts no more than they do any other holobionts' parents. Basically, if, if what's assembled for a progeny's whole uh, microbiome is a random sampling from the microbiome uh, from the pool, then there's no particular reason why its microbiome would resemble its parents' microbiome any more than, than that it does of anybody else's parents' microbiome or any other progeny's uh, microbiome. Unless, of course, we think that there's something about the parent, something about the parents of parents' genes that influences the microbiome, but that's sort of the privilege of the host, which is, I think, what we're trying to get away from doing. So, in fact, there are also no parent offspring lineages, or at least it's very difficult to draw them with so many microbes contributing. And thus, there's no heritable variation for evolution by natural selection to get a grip on. It doesn't fit Lewinton's recipe or Godfrey Smith's requirements. So, I would say that it's not evolution by natural selection. And in fact, um, I think that, um, so this paper, um, which was um, authored by, by Joan and by Scott and uh, by the Rosenbergs and also by Lisa Lloyd, who's uh, in the audience, um, says the following, although a whole lot may be thought of as an individual in some senses, it's, in some sense it is clearly a complicated individual, a whole lot is clearly an interactor, to use terminology, which I will introduce in a minute, because variation among holobionts is subject to selection at the holobiont level. Whether in what sense a holobiont is also a reproducer is more problematic. Unless most of its microbiome is resident, then a holobiont is not a unit of selection in the sense of a replicator. Um, and that's the sense in which I think Peter Godfrey Smith uh, defines a unit of selection. So, in fact, um, holobiont proponents admit that there's a difficulty around this issue. So I'd say, uh, so, so holobiont people have, um, holobiont proponents have proposed various solutions and I would argue that they're not enough to Darwinize holobionts um, and here are the reasons why I would think that. Um, I, I think there's sort of two thrusts to um, um, the um, pushback by holobiont proponents to the opposition by holobiont critics. Uh, and I think they're summarized nicely in the paper that uh, I just cited. Um, but also in more recent work of uh, Lisa Lloyd um, uh, and Scott Gilbert. Uh, Holobionts as organism-like interactors, they certainly are interactors. There's no question about that, and I'm endorsing the interactor role of holobionts and the uh, possible integrated nature of them. And then there are uh, um, Joan Roughgarden's efforts, which I think she reviewed very uh, succinctly and in ways that I don't really understand because I'm not a mathematician. Uh, that holobionts evolve by natural selection. And I would agree that holobionts do evolve by natural selection. I would just say that they don't evolve because of natural selection. That's because of lower level interaction. So again, um, this is sort of the MLS1, MLS2 distinction, but um, I've made these slides and I think I, I think I should show them. 
Um, so uh, on the on this particular thing, we have a case of um, what I think there's no dispute about. Um, it applies to the Avids Bookner, but not to us humans or other whole alliance of contention. And so basically here it's the case if we imagine that the constituent species are either A, which I might consider represents altruists, or S, which might you might consider represents selfish uh, species, but it could be much more general than that. If the presence of many uh, A-type uh, individuals within a holobiont causes that holobiont to make more progeny holobionts, if the holobiont actually reproduces, and it differentially reproduces because of its content of A things, then that's clearly uh, holobiont selection. It is the differential reproduction of holobionts as holobionts that allows natural selection to operate on them as units of selection. And if type A is a cooperator and cooperation enhances holobiont reproduction, there will be there will come to be more cooperative holobionts. That's, that's for the holobionts which are not under contention, but for the holobionts that are under contention, and what I think that Joan Roughgarden's models basically show, although again, I'm not a mathematician, so I could get lost in the weeds, is this. Um, so on the right-hand side, I'm imagining that if you have uh, quite a large number of A's within you, then you get fatter, so you grow bigger, so you produce more progeny of all kinds, more A's, more A's and more S's, and then these are released into a common pool. And because um, having more A's makes you a healthier holobiont and you grow fatter and you produce more individuals of all types, the pool of um, individuals will uh, increase in the fraction of which it has A's. And therefore, when the next generation of holobionts is formed by recruitment from that pool, it will be A richer. And therefore, um, so just on the left there, holobionts with more cooperators produce more individuals, randomly recruited into the next generation of holobionts. If type A is a cooperator and cooperation enhances holobiont growth, there will be more holobionts that are cooperative, but it's not because cooperative holobionts differentially reproduce. They don't actually reproduce at all. So I would say that's not natural selection as envisioned by, by um, Peter Godfrey Smith, for instance, or Dick Lewington. Um, so it's not, not natural selection as impinging upon holobionts, and holobionts are not units of selection. That's probably clear. That doesn't mean that they don't benefit from that. So I'm uh, just quoting a couple of other philosophers and a biologist. The fact that a trait now benefits groups does not entail that it evolved because it was beneficial to groups. So, um, so I would say that the solutions that are currently proposed, although um, Joan in the end of her talk talked about um, uh, um, evolutionary disabled strategies, and I think that might be another way to go, which is not what I'm going to propose now, but it is interesting to ask uh, to what extent are evolutionary stable strategies actually selected for, because they are, in a sense, attractors of the evolutionary process, and a well-developed theory about how uh, evolutionarily stable states are actually selected um, is something that could interest me but that's not what I'm gonna talk about now. Um, these are the solutions that were proposed by us and how they might be enough. So um, you've heard something about, it's the song, not the singer theory, that um, the language goes back a long way. It actually goes back to a Rolling Stones song called It's the Singer, Not the Songs. Um, but uh, it was worked on by Austin Booth when he was a postdoc in my lab and by uh, Drew Aikman more recently in my lab in the papers that I um, sent around. and. Uh, I've written about it on several other occasions too. And, and it, it does come from something which um, Scott referred to um, in his talk, um, the, the observation that uh, function seems to be um, more important to a uh, holobiont or to a uh, microbiome than does the taxa that carry out that function. So that there's a lot of redundancy between taxa, partly because of lateral gene transfer, but also otherwise, um, and it's the function which seems to be the song, or the, it's the song that matters, not the singers, that's really what, where the title came from. So um, I'll just work my way through this, um, uh, it's the song, not the, theory, not the singer, or sometimes abbreviated ITS, NTS, or it's nuts theory, which is um, as follows. <laughs> You imagine that a multi-step process, uh, interaction, metabolic or biogeochemical cycle or a pathway exists. So the nitrogen cycle is my favorite example because 
components of the nitrogen cycle, the various uh, chemical intermediates of the nitrogen cycle can float around in the ocean for a long time and wind up uh, being converted to the next part of the nitrogen cycle in some other place by, by some other taxa. So it's, it's, it's really is a biogeochemical cycle that isn't localized. Um, but because the, such a cycle or any other biogeochemical cycle exists, um, it offers opportunities to the taxa to perform its steps. That a, no, no bacterial species is going to perform something that it doesn't get something out of, and it gets something out of performing its step. It either gets energy or, or nutrients out of that. So each step offers opportunities to organisms to make a living by performing it. And as a result, organisms like, like that, capable of doing that to evolve, they form gills, things with uh, common activity. So gills comprising many species thus evolve to take advantage of these opportunities. Vital gene transfer facilitates this evolution. That's my favorite uh, genetic process. And I would say that the summarizing, summarizing this is to say that because there's a singer, because there's a song, there are singers. But if we imagine that uh, something like the nitrogen cycle gets disrupted by some magical uh, event, um, it would be recreated. It would start up again right away because there are many singers out there that know their own particular part of that song and though nobody knows the whole song, collectively they will reproduce the song. So, um, so I'm calling that because there are singers, there's a song. When members of a different guild, of different guilds reassemble, they implement the whole process again. So it's not like they reproduce it, they reproduce it, they produce it again, even though each one knows it's on its own part. So as a result of this, the process persists, uh, but it persists through um, being produced again or reproduced rather than reproducing itself. So that's basically, it's the song, not the singer theory. Uh, it's related to many other theories. It sounds a little bit like developmental systems theory. It's a little bit like niche construction, but I think it differs from all of those. And, important ways. Um, and uh, particularly relevant to the whole of ion theory is that if I have convinced you in my previous arguments that the claim that the whole of ion is a unit of selection is broken insofar as we will consider the taxa, the specific organisms that are part of the whole of ion, or even the whole of ion, the collective of organisms, if we can say that that is not a unit of selection, as I've just argued, is there something we could call a unit of selection? And I'd say we could call the processes which those uh, taxa uh, implement as the unit of selection. So uh, ITS, NDS, cast the processes collectively implemented by organisms making up a whole amount, not those organisms themselves, individually or collectively, as the relevant unit of selection. It's a matter of process ontology versus thing ontology, if you follow John Dupre's writing about this. And I think this is a kind of process ontology, but it also implies um, some, it says something about things, namely taxa. I think those are things. If you want to talk units of selection, that's how you must talk. So I'm also not claiming that these are units of selection. I'm just saying if you want to find a unit of selection associated with a whole alliance, this is where you have to go. Um, and if you want to go there, then you have to modify Lewinton's recipe a bit. Um, one, you have to say that processes, for example, the nitrogen cycle do not reproduce, but are reproduced by the taxa that have evolved to carry their steps out. And that's a form of heredity. Um, I mean, it, it allows for a form of heredity. Two, that different processes are differently able to simulate uh, the evolution of taxa, to recruit taxa to perform their steps, that carry out their steps, and variation and fitness are defined in those terms. Lateral gene transfer may well play a role here. And that this is a kind of evolution by natural selection based on differential persistence as much as differential reproduction. So Frederick Bouchard has been talking about persistence evolution for some time, and Pierre Borat has been doing that too. Um, and I'm kind of assuming that Charles Darwin would approve if he uh, were alive today. Um, maybe wrong about that. So there is a problem with uh, its uh, theory, which I, um, how much time do I have left, by the way? Um, uh, you still have seven minutes. Oh, good. Okay. So um, there's a problem, I think, with causation. I, I'm not quite sure how to cash this out. I think there's several different ways. Um, but what causes evolution of taxa that perform a step is not the step that the step is part of a process, rather and more immediately, it's the accumulation of products of the preceding step. So it sounds like niche construction to me. And so um, in some ways that's at least in this way, it's not theory is not different from niche construction, and I want to differentiate it from that. Um, one could say, well, it's a whole bunch of different taxa that comprise the niche. In fact, it's the biosphere as a whole that um, 
we could regard as the niche, and that's one way to go. But there's another way to go, and which I think um, that Drew and I have been working on lately, and and we think it's got legs. So here's what it is. This is a um, a, a re reviving of um, David Hall's replicator interactor framework, which has fallen out of fashion uh, philosophically, but which I think is perfectly relevant here. So. Uh, this is from uh, the 1988 book that David Hull wrote about evolution as a process or uh, science as a process, uh, which is locked in my office and I'm not allowed into my office because of COVID-19 restrictions. So I took these quotes from a paper by Peter Godfrey Smith, which I think they're perfectly accurate. Um, replicator is an entity that passes on its structure largely intact through successive replications. And an interactor, which is the important concept here, is an entity that interacts as a cohesive whole with its environment in such a way that this interaction causes replication to be differential. I think this might actually get me around my cause and pro causal problem with its nuts theory, because now I'm saying that its nuts is the replicator, which is the which is caused by the interactor, which are the taxa performing it to um, be differential. But we can go there later. Um, so getting back to this quote, which I showed before from the paper by um, Joan and Scott and uh, Lisa, um, although a holobot may be thought of as an individual, in some sense it's clearly a complicated individual, a holobot is clearly an interactor. So in this paper and more recently, they've developed the interactor notion more thoroughly. I think they still haven't developed it quite as far as I would like to go with it. And so that's what, if we are making an original contribution here, I think we are doing. So um, here's the way I look at it. Um, so this is a complicated table that involves interactors and the replicators whose differential perpetuation is caused by that interactor. And then uh, this is the hierarchy of biological organization, as it were. And on the bottom, we have uh, interactors that are also that also replicate. So obviously, a selfish DNA, a, um, a transposable element, for instance, is a is the replicator is in fact the equivalent of the interactor for an asexual bacterial cell if in fact we regard them as asexual then the whole genome is perpetuated and the re replicator pretty much is causally responsible for the formation of the interactor but the interactor is pretty much causally responsible for the formation of the replicator so they're very tightly coupled if not identical in sexual organisms, this already becomes, begins to come apart a little bit because these uh, interactors reproduce, but they do not replicate. Um, so genes contributing to organismal fitness cached out as individually selfish genes uh, collaborate like rowers in the same shell. So the interactors are reproducers, but they're not replicators. And I think it's the fact that interactors are reproducers, but not replicators, and that the um, interactors eventually um, lose, uh, well, it's the genes which are then the, the eternal objects here that are perpetuated by a process of selection. And I think that's why Richard Dawkins wrote the Selfish Gene book in the first place because of, because of sex, basically. And then we have at the higher level um, things, interactors which um, don't reproduce even. So they're not, they're not um, either replicators or reproducers. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't have uh, underlying replicators whose differential perpetuation they cause. So uh, for a whole alliance or microbial communities, uh, I would say that those uh, replicators are the genes which determine whole alliance or community level functions. Um, and you might imagine those are genes promoting the production of public goods, for instance. Replicators are selected via the community as a relevant interactor. So the vision here, which is what sort of stimulated this way of thinking on my part was that there are certain genes whose, whose uh, expression results in, um, in community level properties rather than individual level properties. And that those genes will be successful, will, will do better if the communities that they confer those properties on do better in terms of getting bigger, growing fatter, and therefore producing more in the MLS woolen sense, or uh, replicating and um, and duplicating in the MLS2 sense, either way. So we could cash that out in terms of selfish genes. We could look at selfish genes all the way up. So here the red gene at the bottom differentially reproduces or at, at our, at the red gene differentially reproduces or persists because it favors the proliferation or delays the extinction of individual organisms within a species. 
but at a higher level that differentially reproduces or persists because it favors the proliferation or delays the extinction of individual communities within an environment, or at a higher level still, it, it uh, differentially reproduces or persists because it favors the proliferation or delays the extinction of community environment types within the biosphere at large. So you could go all the way up with selfish genes, or you could do something like this. You could say that what it is that's the replicator in a community at a community level is in fact the whole bacterial species. It might be the whole bacterial genome. Um, different bacterial species are selected for because they play uh, beneficial roles in certain communities, um, because they contribute to the robustness or the growth of that community. So we could we could look at um, the whole bacterial species as the reproducer or the replicator, which is selected for by the interactor, which is the community. So I'd say that the interactors become the replicators at the next higher level in this way of thinking about things. Um, I thought that was kind of original, but then I stumbled across this paper by Kim Sterlney and um, others, in which they pretty much articulate something like that notion. They say a conception of evolutionary history which recognizes both genetic and non-genetic replicators, lineages of replicators and interactors has advantages over, over both the radical rejection of the replicator interactor distinction, which was at that time under threat, mm -hmm. and the conservative restriction of replication to genetic replication. So I have a final word here and I probably have run out of time, but I'm gonna plow ahead with this last word because I think it's in some ways the most important thing and I'm just going to read what I wrote there. So, but uh, the pictures are important. We have a biofilm which recruits a taxa of certain types and not other types to function collectively as a community. We have shower heads, which in fact have characteristic microbes, as my former postdoc, postdoc supervisor Norm Pace has shown. We have whale falls, where the whale falls at the bottom and is it sends the host for a bunch of microbes that decay it, but presumably whales are not selected in order to do that. And then we have a complex ecosystem as represented by various microbes. And what I want to say about this is that is the following: structured microbial communities are everywhere. There's no reason to privilege those associated with animal or plant hosts as special in any way. Nor is there any reason to privilege the host lineage. That was the problem we set out to fix. We can't develop a community of genetics which just is host genetics. That doesn't seem to be reasonable nor is there any reason to focus on microbes. This is community ecology. ecology. Uh, and so this is not different from normal ecology. The larger goal is a community genetics, uniting ecology and evolutionary biology. I think that is the goal. I think that's the challenge that we all face. And I think the whole bio concept may be useful, but a temporary bridging device in that effort to unite ecology and evolution uh, more thoroughly. Thank you. Oh, so thank you. Thanks for um, Andrew and Tyler, who are both present at this Zoom, and for Austin, who was uh, in this, uh, involved initially. Thanks. Thank you very much, for Thank you. Um, I'll stop sharing. Wonderful. Okay, let me see if people already started to raise their hands. I see they, 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 they clapped. Lisa. No, oh, that's nice. <laughs> uh, Lisa, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I, I thought that was very interesting. And I, I really, really liked how um, you um, worked through things and thought about things. Um, and I really liked where you ended up. And I thought you would be very interested that um, Mike Wade and I have um, written a paper constructing no. um, the um, holobiont uh, question in terms of community genetics, where mm -hmm. translate the interactor question into community genetics and present um, a model of evolutionary stable strategies in terms of community genetics and show, for example, that horizontal and vertical um, transmission are evolutionary stable strategies that have mutualism as a stable strategy for most of the state space. Yep, no, I, I read that paper. Yep. Oh, right. Um, because I thought that was very um, much along the lines of where you were uh, sympathetic to. Um, oh, no, I think I, I think I am sympathetic to that. Um, right. Um, and um, I also was re really interested um, that uh, 
you, uh, process ontology versus thing ontology contrast that you were making, because I agree that um, the kind of um, Lewintonian approach to units of selection is not useful because it's a thing ontology, and that the Hullian approach of um, uh, interactors and replicators is a process ontology, and it's valuable for that very reason, and it can be built on for that very reason. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I went about analyzing units of selection, I expanded the Hull ontology into not just you, interactors and replicators, but also beneficiaries and right. manifestations of adaptation. And, and I found that to be um, the um, most um, uh, pr process-oriented way to go about understanding units of selection and, and much more useful than the thing-oriented approach of fluency, mm -hmm. which I valued but didn't find to be the most um, perspicacious way to analyze this, the real problems with it. So I really like the way you unpack that. Um, and um, I, I was just wondering um, whether, um, and, and, and that's the analysis that I gave in my Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy um, uh, essay on units of selection. Um, you may be right that it's fallen out of fashion philosophically, but it's still the Stanford Encyclopedia of philosophy essay on. Yeah, know, not that far out. Um, yeah, um, but, but I was wondering what you thought about the community genetics um, stuff that we were doing. Um, is that along the lines that you're looking for or? Well, I think it is, yeah. And I, th I think, I mean, I, 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 in, the, in the end, I think we're actually all gonna come to an agreement about this, but um, what, I don't think we're there yet. And, and what worries me about a lot of community genetics, it, it really does seem to be that it seems to be, it's about the genetics of the, uh, some keystone species that's involved in, and therefore how that, um, the genetics of that species affects the structures of the community. And I think that's not enough. It's really, it's really gotta be the, I mean, you have to sort of get rid of the notion of individual organisms and just look at the, gene, the genes that affect the properties of the community. I oh. think you've really heard that too. In, in the applications, they start with let's take a host species and here's its microbiome and stuff like that. You I mean instead of the more abstract, let's take two species. These are there. These are there. Yeah, it yeah. sort of goes along. It goes along with metagenomics, the metagenomics approach. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, it, no, it I means... agree with you. I agree with you. I think, and I think that the the models that we presented are totally adaptable to any context like that because we just present yeah. take two genes, take two genes, and any two species. Yeah, no, I think I think lateral gene transfer is a really useful process, which is good because it's my favorite. I mean, you could you could look at the genes for nitrogen fixation, let's say, because they are frequently laterally transferred and they clearly are sort of structured so that they can be laterally transferred. That those are genes that actually belong to the nitrogen cycle. They don't belong to any particular organism. They exactly. Belong. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that. Okay, so Javier. Yes, thank you. It's a good moment because we are talking about lateral gene transfer. And well, thank you for. So I have um, a couple of points uh, because, of course, I agree that you cannot say that all holobions are reproducers. But the question is whether some holobions might be reproducers, right? And you know from my work that I've analyzed some cases like the vampire bats and others in which you have highly specific patterns of recognition, both on the host side and on the micro side, and by micro, I mean microbiome. And Margaret has studied very carefully the cases of recognition in squid vibrio and in others. And those mechanisms that have evolved seem to be guaranteeing that some functional genes in the microbiome transgenerationally reoccur with the same bat, with the same host taxon. Now, whether this is general or not in all animal taxon, that's an open empirical question. And probably you're right, it's not true. But in some taxons, it seems clear that you have something like that with a big part of the microbiome, right? How would you explain this? I mean, that seems to be a clear case in which some holobions, of course not all, but some seem to be acting as reproducers. And those mechanisms seem to have been selected in that sense, right? Yeah, well, 
I mean, I don't have a problem with that. I, I mean, um, to the extent that you're talking about things that, that are vertically transmitted, then, you know, I don't actually regard, um, I mean, that, so the book neuro that are part of aphids, that's just a fancy chromosome, right? I mean, it's just a, a weird chromosome that's inherited by some weird mechanism, but it nevertheless is just another chromosome of the aphid. And, and so a microbiome that's in, vertically inherited is really just another complex chromosome of the host and, or of the whole thing. Um, but the peculiarity, not, sorry. Go ahead. I, 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 the I'm peculiarity not, is that it's not vertically transmitted, it's horizontally <laughs> acquired, having mechanisms both in the host taxon that have genetically evolved and in some uh, genetic, uh, in some genetic elements of some microbes that have evolved for this recognition to happen. Okay. Is well, there a vertical that, transmission? You can redefine it and have it. Sure, no, okay. Well, I, uh, well, so then I, I would use this analogy. Um, we've evolved to use cows, and cows have evolved to be used by us. But would we call us and cows together a whole biont? I mean, I don't think we would. That because it's, it's, it's basically coevolution. I mean, it, what you're talking about now, I think, is coevolution, and I, I'm perfectly fine with the coevolution. I just don't think it makes the unit together uh, a unit that's, sub, that's a unit of selection. There are two units of selection here. But the reason why I don't call it coevolution is because what there is those patterns of recondition in some cases, like I studied very carefully the vampire bat, is between the host, and that means the baby host and some microbes, but they don't need to be the same taxa, but some functional elements that can be horizontally transferred yeah. between microbes. And that's precisely why it's not coevolution, because coevolution requires to fix a species, coevolving, right? There might be coevolution between the host and some alleles in different microbes, which is something Lisa has also studied in her paper with Wei. But that's what I think is key. And I think it's a key uh, observation that derives from hologenome thinking. Okay, um, I'll have to read that more. <laughs> okay, uh, John Roughgarden is next. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. So uh, thanks for that. And um, let me uh, uh, speak to a couple points. First, uh, the issue of the singer and not the song, or the song and not the singer. Um, I, I think I mentioned in one of my papers that uh, th my initial uh, reaction to this is that it uh, wasn't new from the standpoint of community ecology because we have classically characterized communities in terms of niches and the niches are functional niches and uh, uh, Hutchinson and MacArthur and to some extent Levins, Richard Levins and his modeling are the people well best known for this and others including myself and Robert May uh, elaborated on this at some length. And, uh, and so the, and that then also led to a lot of research about uh, uh, convergent community structure in different continents and Martin Cody was particularly mm -hmm. active in this. Now, uh, the problem, though, is that this, th there are two problems with it. One is that it's a descriptive uh, and not an, uh, an, a descriptive device and not an explanatory device. Um, because we don't have an a priori theory of uh, what community structure ought to look like independent of the, ki of the kinds of organisms that uh, supply it. Um, and to develop a, a theory of community structure in the abstract, you would need to have a description of what kinds of individuals were potentially able to supply it and uh, uh, what kinds of resources would be available to those, to those species. And uh, so it, it, that was my initial reaction to the idea is that uh, We've been there and it's great and, and uh, it's wonderful to see this being done. And I, appear, I appreciate that this is patronizing to some extent, but that was my take on it. And that uh, it was intended to be provocative, but we, and again, in ecology have had uh, 
decades of people trying to dismiss species and the ecosystem ecologists, especially during the 70s and 80s, would try to say, oh, well, that bird doesn't matter. We just, what's important about that bird is what its contribution is to energy flow and so on. And, uh, but the bottom line from this is that uh, although niche structure and the, uh, continues to be a good way to describe a community, it doesn't go very far because people do want to know what the species are. Um, as, as ecologists, our constituency to a large extent are con conservation biologists and naturalists, amateur naturalists. And uh, just tell a bird watcher that they're not supposed to care about the species that's sitting on their tree. Just say, oh, well, that's a foliage gleaner. No, 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 that won't do. You really need to know what the species is because that's what people care about. And um, so then as, when we come to, uh, to microbial systems, it seems to me, again, the actual identity of the species of, uh, is really pretty critical. We see this, for example, in the COVID virus situation where uh, different antibodies are made to different strains of the virus. And people really want to know what, kind, what particular virus is, is around. And similarly for different strains of malaria and so forth. So it seems to me that the program of substituting um, functional definitions uh, in, in place of taxonomic definitions is destined to fail based on the track record we already have. So that's, that's my first point. Now, okay. my, uh, <laughs> okay, the, you wanna to speak to that and I have another uh, issue as well. Yeah, yeah, hold on to the other issue. I mean, I, um... Well, I, I mean, I think that that certainly the effort in ecology to replace, you know, trait trait based ecology rather than species based ecology, and and I would agree that it probably fails for those reasons. And I'm not an ecologist after all, but but I think that the the good thing about its nuts was it was actually proposing that that was a unit of selection that that selection could operate on those things. And so then I think it gives license, for instance, to talk about ecosystem function, which hitherto wasn't really available because it wasn't the notion, I mean, it wasn't as if ecosystems um, were evolved systems that could therefore be said to have functions. So the problem with ecosystem function was the, you'd have to be using the F word in a way, in a way different than we would be using it for, let's say, the function of my hand is to grasp things because we think that, you know, evolution has produced the hand that grasps things. Um, because, you know, variants, you know, whatever. Um, and we don't think that about ecological situations or niche, niches in ecologically, even though we recognize that there are certain favored niches. So um, I think it's around that, which the issues have evolved. I, I, but that's, okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, first question. Um, in the ecosystem ecologists need to stipulate a function rather than to uh, and they, right. they need to declare that energy flow is important. And I, I'm um, giving them the license to, to call that a function by, in the same way yeah, that it Yeah, because of, uh, the, the, of its evolution. Uh, right. Okay, now the, the other question is, I, I don't honestly understand why we have any disagreement. Um, I don't think we do anymore, really. And, and, uh, and I, I guess I'm not as enthusiastic as you are about attaching a, uh, a new, any new theory to Darwin. Um, and I appreciate that you've shown pictures of, dare I say, all male scientists and a lot of pictures of Darwin in a, in a laudatory kind of framework. And, um, and this does seem to have a uh, uh, almost an ideological flavor to it. And I know that must be offensive for me to say that. But nonetheless, that, that is a reaction that I have. And I don't understand why you would want to say that uh, a theory of how holobionts evolve and their hologenomes is or isn't Darwinian. It does involve selection on individuals, and it's Darwinian in that sense, where the individual is the interactor. And, uh, and I don't see any reason why one would want to endorse uh, Lewinton's three criteria in this day and age. And uh, 
So well, I'm puzzled as to what's motivating you to do this. Um, well, okay. Um, I, I think that, so, so, I mean, part of what I, what I was saying in my talk, and I think that, um, I'm not sure that we agree on this, but I think that, that your model for um, holobiont evolution and holobiont selection really is uh, MLS1, uh, mostly. Uh -huh. and, and the fact that it's MLS1, um, within what I'm defining as the Darwinian tradition, means that it's not MLS2, and therefore you can't talk about functions of holobionts, for instance, or adaptations of holobionts, unless holobionts reproduce. And, and so I'm trying to get around that because I think that reproduction is falsely assumed to be the only criterion, you know, differential reproduction is the only possible outcome of evolution by natural selection. I'm thinking, no, that differential persistence is also a possible outcome. And, and so all of that, to my mind, is an attempt to continue with the Darwinian tradition. And I'm not actually, um, I, I, I'm saying that if you want to condition, con continue with that tradition, this is where you have to go. I'm not saying you have to go there. I'm just saying here, this is where you have to go if, the, if that's the tradition that you want to follow. Do you see what I'm, the distinction there? Well, I, I do, but again, I don't agree with it. And I think if Darwin, how could we ever tell? I think if Darwin were alive, he actually well, would endorse the kind of uh, model uh, that I've put out for horizontal selection. Because as you know, Darwin didn't have a, a clear concept of inheritance. No, well, that's and the problem. So, <laughs> and, and so if he would, uh, and, and you were alluding to this too in your account, um, if we have uh, a what I've been terming a collective inheritance or what you are, are apparently terming re-production re and, and uh, others have called recurrent assembly or recurrent reconstruction, this amounts to getting a population in the next generation that does resemble a selected subset of the population. It, 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 it doesn't but there resemble. it is. But isn't that inheritance? And wouldn't that be good enough for Darwin? Um, I don't know. Um, it, it's certainly not the same as, as what, it's certainly not the same as, as mainstream Darwinists have turned the Darwinian notion into. Well, I, mean, I agree, it's not, neo, it's not neo-Darwinism, it's not Mendelian it's Darwinism. Okay. It's, it's not neo-Darwinism. Um, right. And again, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying that it, it is neo-Darwinism, uh, and 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 uh, okay. And I think the other the other thing that that um, that I was trying to say is that I think, and and that's sort of what my last slide was. Um, I think the holobiont concept is very useful, and I think it's it's beneficial. But I think it's actually temporary in the sense that what we're really trying to do is unite ecology and evolution here, and and that that the whole abiont concept gained a lot of its buzz around the false belief that that um, that whole abiants were units of selection in, the, in what I'm calling a neo-Darwinian sense. And, yeah. and that's not true. Yeah, um, that's not true. Right, we, we, we agree with that, yeah. And, and, that's, and, and a lot of the buzz around the whole abiants and the reason there's so many papers in biology and philosophy about whole abiants is partly because of that implication that it was true. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so next is Scott and then Margaret. Okay, thank you. First, thank you for an excellent talk. It's wonderful. I'm sympathetic to the process biology. Matter of fact, I wrote a paper titled something like Organisms as Concretions of Processes. But mm -hmm. in the process biology, uh, you know, one has this flow. You know, we're not the cells that we were. 20 years ago, we're not the metabolites that we were a year ago, and we're also not the symbionts. So I just see us as a, you know, as flux, but a concretion of all these things. Uh, Javier pointed out, uh, and I think was circling around this idea that uh, one of the words that you used that immediately set up uh, flags for me was uh, that, uh, symbionts or microbes were recruited randomly and assembled randomly. And uh, you use that adverb twice in your slides. And one of the things that I was trying to say is that 
No, it isn't random. If it was random, we wouldn't have whole abiance. But there's selection on the part of you, Primna. There's selection on the part of uh, uh, humans that, uh, w you know, many are called, few are chosen. That uh, uh, no. there is, that it is not random. Uh, no, but it, well, I, I didn't mean like totally random. I, I meant that it was random amongst the pool of, of microbionts, of, of microbes that were released by the previous generation of holobionts. Well, I, don't, so, I don't know if it is. I think it's selection from this, which makes it very non-random. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, if, if, if we have a holobiont that has to have, let's say, 10% of species A and 90% and of species B, and it releases those into the environment, and there's all those other species through, up through Z that are out there, but you can only recruit A's and, Z and, and, and B's, then you're going to recruit 10% A's and 90% B's um, randomly. But it doesn't mean that you'll recruit the Z's. Uh, you see what I'm yeah, yep. Okay. So, so, so it can be quite specific, but, but it's, not, it's not specific in terms of the release from the previous holobiont. That's all I'm saying. Right, but you get the same species or the same groups yeah. that are... Yeah, Which no problem. The way of inheriting something. Right. And, uh -huh. and the whole point of that was that simply it's the case that if you recruit in that way, uh, in that extreme model, then, then there's really no difference between what you recruit and what your, you know, your neighbor that recruits, who was a child of some other holobiont recruited. Right? So, so there's, no, there's, there's, no very, there's no heritable variation. Right. And at least they're depending on the genome of the organism, which could propose... The genome, I mean, the genomes of organisms might vary. Might and, vary. And so that, that would be and a difference. And holobionts, yeah. But, but, then, but then we don't need holobiont theory. We just, we need just, you know... And, and the resources, I agree. Right. Uh, but I think that the notion that, uh, that there's a random, that it goes randomly, is very different because we have, uh, in a way, a very Darwinian selection for the microbes. That, that come in. Yeah, well, no, uh, I, I, but I think that's already happened. I mean, yes. And, so. and, and I think that, you know, uh, I don't want the notion of the holobiont to be a loose aggregation because what I find is that in what we have is, is not only co-evolution, but co-development, which is a much more intimate thing. And that uh, you, you need to have certain processes taking place such that the animal develops normally. And sometimes this could be, as you say, with a guild oh. of microbes, but sometimes it's a very specific microbe, like in- oh, yeah. uh, no, no. I, I have no problem with that. I mean, it, it's, that's, it's, and, it's, and it's really uh, lovely that, that we're now appreciating how intricately microbes are connected to the development and whatever of of, of hosts, I, which is yeah. a surprise to me, right? I mean, uh, oh, it's um, a surprise to me too. <laughs> but, but, it uh, but, it but it doesn't make the collective a unit of selection. That was my whole point. No, nope. this is the next thing, and I, there's some evidence coming out, which uh, I think is just fascinating. And uh, uh, again, uh, the uh, what the uh, rough skinned newt here in Oregon is a poisonous newt. You go out into the wilderness and you're told, don't touch the salamanders uh, because you're, you, you might numb your hands by doing so. And only drunks have eaten these salamanders and they've died. Uh, they're very poisonous salamanders. But the thing is, the salamander genome has nothing to do with the poison. The poison is made by Aramonas and Pseudomonas, uh, two bacteria, two species of bacteria, which get to the salamander no one is really sure. It looks like there's some egg contribution and there's some environmental contribution. Uh, but what you have is just a fascinating story because the salamander genome has to evolve to accommodate the tetrodotoxin being put out by the mm -hmm. bacteria. And it does by having mutations in the gene encoding its voltage uh, sensitive uh, sodium channel. So the sodium channel gene has been mutated in the salamander. And that's mm -hmm. a great accommodation to the symbiont. In addition, the snake, which eats the salamander, has also to, uh, to mutate if it's going to find the salamander to be tasty and edible. Mm -hmm. So 
we have now a kind of a three-way thing where you have the sodium channel evolving for accommodation in the, in the salamander, the sodium channel evolving for being able for predation in the snake, and the bacteria evolving to make more tetrodotoxin. And so here you have, I think, a very, you know, I think that this is kind of what you're wanting in the way of a whole of biont where the bacteria and the host are really intimately together, even though they are separate organisms, and they have a mutual, you know, there's a mutual alliance not to be eaten by the snake. Sure, but so, I mean, that's fine, but it, I mean, the, the color evolution can explain that quite nicely, right? I mean, we don't need, I mean, it could be that uh, the salamanders were um, at risk for being poisoned by these bacteria until they, until a mutant that was less sensitive to that toxin arose, and then they could host the bacteria, and that was good because it made them resistant to being eaten by snakes, and so the snakes had to evolve a, um, a resistant form of, of that receptor, and it, so I mean, it, it all makes sense in terms of each, I mean, it, it's not different than, than I mean, you know, chickens have crops, right? And they, they pick up, the, I think a baby chicken, well, Joan would know this better than I do because there are wild chickens around there, but they run around the environment picking up stones to fill their crops, right? And, mm -hmm. and they probably pick up certain kinds of stones, but we wouldn't actually say that stones had evolved in order to be picked up by the chickens. No, but we would say that the bacteria, I think the bacteria are now being transported through the eggs of the salamander. Okay, well that's really so cool. so it's not it's not like you know the stone is being transmitted you know through uh, you know chicken eggs or anything. Not that. Oh, right. Okay. Right. So, so I think that there's you know being accommodation through the well, whole and and, and I, it, it, it is also the case. I mean, I I, I think I was saying that that I in my view, uh, once you have vertical transmission, then you might as well just be talking about different chromosomes or you know it's. These are parts of the genes of the same thing, so it's it's not vertical transmission is never the problem. It's always horizontal. Or it's more the intermediate neighborhood transmission, but yeah. Well, yeah, okay. Well, that's that's a kind of vertical transmission, I guess, yeah. so quasi vertical. Right. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Margaret, you've been very patient. I think it's going to be the last question. She's muted, though. Thomas, Bosch. You. Thomas Bosch, are you there? Are you still there, Tom? Okay, so, so for me, um, you know, as, as most of you know, I'm a biochemist physiologist. So, <laughs> the, I'm, you know, the, the arguments you guys are making are, but the, the, the case that I find so compelling is Thomas Bosch came into studying Hydra and Hydra communities um, after 25 years of, of studying Hydra development. And one of his students wanted to look at the surface microbiome and he, they did that and they found 12 or 15 phylotypes um, and they had three species of hydra uh, in their group and each one of those hydra species, despite the fact that there was all kinds of contamination, each one of them with fidelity would have this particular uh, set of microbes. So you could say, oh, well, you know, the chemistry is choosing. Well, what Thomas, the genius of his PNAS paper in 2007, was he goes out to the field and collects the same species of hydra. And if he doesn't find the same phylotypes that he found in the lab with fidelity to each one of those, was found on the surface of these hydra in the field. And so in my mind, and they're, you know, partially vertically and partially horizontally transmission transmitted. I wish you were on the line so he could tell me I'm wrong about the whole damn thing. He but uh, uh, Tommy, you on? See, he's, he's not answering. Oh, Thomas? Right. Yeah, anyway. Um, so, so to me, that's, that's a phenomenal example of, of, a, of a community of microbes. In the case of, of what, what uh, Scott was talking about, with regard to something, you know, humans, one of the problems I have as a person not in your field reconciling what you're saying is that people like Dave Roman and, and uh, Mark, you know, Martin Blazer and uh, Rob Knight and so on have shown that 
that you acquire a certain set of microbes in each individual. Uh, it comes to maturation between the ages of two and four, concomitant with the maturation of the immune system. And, you know, it's an open system. So you get a huge number of, of microbes coming in from the food and your dog and your blah, 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 blah. But each person has their own individual fingerprint that, that is, is something that they retain if they starve, if they move, if they, you know, do whatever. And when you change your diet, the ratios and proportions of those go up and down. But there is a fingerprint to that. And so I, I don't know. One of, and the last thing I'm going to say is one of the things that, like I said, as a person, not a practitioner, thinking deeply about it as you guys do, but listening to Eugene Coonan talk about the fact that, you know, the, we, we need something beyond neo-Darwinism. We need something beyond the modern synthesis, in my opinion, um, you know, because, you know, the vast majority of the world does not operate on vertical transmission of traits. So with that, I'll stop. <laughs> okay, I don't disagree with you. I think we do need something. I just don't think we've got it yet. <laughs> That's all. Okay, okay, yeah, I, you know, I'm certainly not gonna be the one to develop such a thing. But yeah, Ford, what do you think about Thomas and, and Joan? What do you think about Thomas's example? Well, I mean, uh, for me, it, it's not surprising. I mean, it, um, it's, it's just coevolution. It's just, you know, the, the microbes have evolved to be on the, on the uh, hydra and the hydra has evolved to have those microbes on it. And that's beneficial. It might even be beneficial to both of them, but it doesn't mean that um, either one couldn't have evolved as if the other was basically its, its environment. You know, it doesn't have to be a living environment because you find certain characteristic microbes. I mean, if you look at shower heads, for instance, you would find a characteristic microbiota on different shower heads. You but if you have that shower head for 30 years, and you, <laughs> you know, well, you shower heads are not nearly as good as, as hydras are, <laughs> but <laughs> nevertheless, there is some specificity about it. Mm -hmm. So specificity is not, uh, to my mind, evidence that... Oh, I agree. I, I, it's just that I found that pretty breathtaking. Oh, actually. it's amazing. Amazing how much specificity there is, yes. I don't know deny that. I don't have anything to add, but thanks for asking. <laughs> okay. Um, it's getting pretty late here in France um, and, and, and in Europe more generally. Uh, unless uh, someone has something uh, very pressing to say, um, I would really like to thank our three speakers. I think you did really great. I mean, fantastic talks, great discussions, and you're very open-minded people. So disagreeing in this way, I think is very, very uh, nice. And uh, that was very, very informative and useful for, 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 for us. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say is that I will keep you updated about the second uh, workshop, virtual workshop we want to organize. As I said, uh, Margaret, Thomas, and uh, Thomas Bosch and a few others already said they, uh, uh, they uh, agreed to give a talk. So um, again, thank you so much for uh, um, this uh, discussion today. And I hope to see you all very soon on Zoom, if not in Bordeaux. Thank <laughs> you very much, Thomas. Thank you, yeah. Thomas. Thank you so much. And thank you to every speaker. <laughs> Thank you all and see you soon. Great to see you. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.